Good evening. Today is the 20th day of October 2020. The time is 6.30. We'd like to begin our City Council regular meeting. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. If you'll please rise and join us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And I'd ask our city clerk if uh, you'd go through roll call. And just one thing, Mayor, uh, we are having a, some technical difficulties with the audio, at least going to like YouTube in our live stream. Okay. So, just to be aware. All right. Similar to what we had the last couple of council meetings? Yeah, something like that, probably. But we're working on it? Yep. All right. Hopefully we'll get that cleared up. Thank you for letting us know. Yeah. Okay. Harrington? Here. McKinney? Is absent. O'Doherty? Here. Pierce? Here. Schuster? Here. Stalder? Here. Weaver? Here. Gabriel? Here. And Shumway? Here. That is eight present and one absent, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Um, each city council regular meeting, we begin with the public comments. Um, uh, the first public comment period is on non-agenda items. And then we have a public comments at the end in which any topic may be addressed. Uh, I'm going to go through a few things on uh, the uh, public comment period uh, and ask for everyone to uh, if you want to review this, to go to our, our the city website, and it's all uh, every everything is uh, laid out there. Now, um, everyone will have three minutes to speak. We'd ask you to identify by name so that we can have a record of that, and then we will keep the clock running. I'll let you know when the three minutes are up. I want to read a guideline that we have as I did in the last meeting, just to remind us that uh, a couple of things. One is that we want to have productive public comments and they should not include threatening or obscene language, personal defamatory statements, or any disorderly conduct that impedes, disrupts, or disturbs the orderly conduct of any meeting, hearing, or other proceeding. Now with that, I want to say this. Everyone realizes that it's very, very important that we give everyone a chance to exercise their constitutional rights to have free and open discussion. And I believe the Constitution says that we should have peaceable assembly with the right to make any statement that we want as long as it doesn't interfere with um, peaceably assembly. Our council guidelines have been reviewed and we feel like that the couple of things that I brought up there are important for us to, to, to maintain a business-like meeting and also decorum in our meeting. So I'm going to ask those that speak to consider that. If uh, I feel like that you have gone beyond what we've asked you to do, I again will ask you to um, let the next person speak. So our city clerk has a long list of people that have asked to speak, both in our council uh, public comment Mr. period and also during our regular uh, meeting on our regular agenda. I'm going to have point of information. Now. Point of information, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, Councilor Weaver. Thank you. I, I appreciate your, your coverage of the Council Code of Conduct prior to the public uh, comment period. It's not a secret. This is a uh, controversial topic right now. Um, emotions have been running high. And there has been a lot of discussion. Certainly, I read the emails that were received after last week. But, Mr. Mayor, as a point of information, I would like to give the city attorney an opportunity to confirm one thing, and I'll pose it this way as this point of information. And that is that there is an extensive, extensive body of case law that establishes how local governments, like a city council or a town council or a county commission, can structure their meetings to maintain order while still protecting the constitutionally important First Amendment rights. And I, I think it would be important to have him 
confirm that that is in fact the case as a nice uh, addendum to your courtesy coverage of the code of conduct, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Weaver. Uh, Mr. Southard, I believe you're on Zoom. If you would like to make comments, go ahead. And by the way, uh, public comment will be 30 minutes. We'll, we'll begin that 30 minutes once we start the public comment period. Mr. Southard. Yeah, Mayor and Council, um, uh, Councilor Weaver is, of course, correct. Um, all public bodies have the right to maintain order when they take public comments. There are a number, I mean, the, uh, you know, the categories of disorder are manifold and they're impossible to list. But, it, but it's certainly uh, within the right of any public body, including city council, to maintain an orderly uh, and, uh, I don't know if productive is the word, uh, but um, an orderliness that allows a productive meeting. <clears throat> okay, thank you. All right, I'll ask our city clerk to read the first. And by the way, oh, 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 Councilor Pierce, 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 we're going we're, to, again, we're going to give you 30 minutes, but let's go through this preliminary. Councilor Pierce. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just want uh, folks to know that, that we're having difficulty hearing. Um, our city attorney, Southerd, cut out on while he was talking a bit as well as you did mayor for me earlier maybe it's my connection but maybe everybody else is experiencing the same thing as well so just want to keep that keep that out front for folks who might not be able to hear so well we have several people that are on zoom with us so thank you for that We're, we'll continue to work on making sure that we have a you know, everyone has a, a chance to hear and understand everything. Okay, now the time, we're gonna go until 10 minutes after seven o'clock with public comments if we go that long. And I'll ask our city clerk to read the first name. And by the way, these are randomized, so a lot of people called in and it's a lottery in the sense that whoever's chosen, it's they're listed in a random order and it has only only to do with randomizing and nothing else. Uh, City Clerk. Okay, Mayor. The first public comment is from Victoria Rasmussen Dixon. Go ahead, Victoria. Good evening, Mayor Shumway and Council Members. I'm Victoria Rasmussen Dixon, writing candidate for Laramie City Council Ward 3. I'd like to take this time to thank you all. I know that your job as Council Members and Mayor is not always easy, but I do appreciate you taking the time out of your life to do your civic duty and being on the City Council. Today I went back to rewatch the last two City Council meetings, and I noticed that both of those meetings have been updated on YouTube to show the meetings in their entirety. It's important that the citizens of our community are able to see everything that transpires in these public meetings, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. It's important that our citizens' voices are heard. Thank you for coming around and doing the right thing. I also wanted to voice my support on the traffic control project on 3rd and Flint. I would encourage the city to do everything possible to make sure this project goes forward in a timely manner. I'd like to also take a moment to express some public appreciation for our law enforcement, firefighters, and medical personnel. We all know that 2020 has been a challenging year on many fronts. These men and women deserve our respect and support, and I urge the City Council to do everything in their power to make sure they have the resources and support that they need. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Victoria. City Clerk. Lindsay Conyers. Yeah, she's on Zoom. Have to speak. There we go. Yes, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, Lindsay, go ahead. Thank you. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, I thank you for the opportunity to be heard here today. 
I am here as a resident of the city of Laramie for over 35 years, and I'm here to address my employees, you. You all work for us and not the other way around. That being said, I ask for this body to address the following. But first, I would like to thank Mr. Harrington for his composure last week for allowing Mr. Shapley to speak in this public forum. That being said, if it is okay for a council person to be asked to recuse themselves due to a perceived bias for the police, then surely the inverse is true as well. If we are going to follow the code of conduct, maybe we should start with following the Constitution, as surely the First Amendment and the Open Meetings Act take precedent over the city's co council code of conduct. I ask you what constitutes a personal attack. I ask that we be given clear guidelines to follow so that we can avoid any further confrontation. I would also like to know the rules of how I am allowed to show my displeasure with the actions of my elected officials. If not here, then where? I think Mr. Shapley deserves an apology for his, the violation of his um, First Amendment rights from last week. Technical difficulties are censorship. We deserve an explanation of these difficulties and your plan to fix it. Also, there must be immediate release of the entire recordings from August 19th and any other edited video to date, which I believe you guys have done, so I thank you for that. Um, I am looking for um, resolution of this fast tracking of new ordinances. It negates the public's ability to fully understand them and, it form and formulate any opposition. The residents don't know about some of these things until they are done deals, and that is because this body purposely rushes them through the process to further their own agendas, and I ask you whose pocket is being lined here. Politics by ambush have been made, have made their way into these chambers with walk-on resolutions at a, on a regular basis, and they need to be done away with immediately. The lottery system needs to be made public, in that the drawing of names needs to be made available to be watched by the public to ensure fairness. This body must also look into moving their meetings to a larger venue in order to provide more venue and more space for people to speak and attend these meetings. I understand that that would then require you to be transparent and open to the community, but as public officials, this is what you were signed up for. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lindsay. City Clerk. Mary Milstead. Yes, Mary, just come up. This short microphone is the one you want to speak into. Thank you. When I moved here from uh, when I moved here from Colorado, I expected to find a quiet little town where neighbors, new neighbors, and my grandchildren could play and have a carefree childhood that everyone deserves. As I began to settle in and familiarize myself with my surroundings, I realized how far apart my hopes were from my reality. I started asking myself questions like, why is this university town so full of poverty? Why, the poorest, we're the poorest county in the state and we have a supposed wonderful university. Why are there no jobs here? How can some people afford these crappy little houses that are exorbitantly expensive? Why are the streets so dirty and the yards overgrown with weeds? Why are my property taxes here more than my Colorado home was and I have three times the amount of house and yard in Colorado? These were only my immediate questions which I have literally brought which have literally brought me here today. However, they're not my only questions. Upon asking myself these questions, one word kept popping into my head over and over. That word is corruption. This town is so out of balance with jobs that don't pay enough to afford a home, water costs so high that people can't afford to water their lawns, a less than functional street department that should have weekly cleaning routes, a city does not uh, and city codes for home and business owners to control weeds on their property as well as require the city to take care of their own weeds and enforce these codes. I began to try to find answers and I'm finding rabbit hole after rabbit hole as each question turns into more questions. How does a town with a 2019 population of roughly 38,000 people claim the fame of being the poorest county in the state and has next to no industry offering jobs or growth. How does Laramie, Wyoming afford to pay a city council or a city manager $200,000 a year before benefits and bonuses when this town looks like a
I'm still working on finding the answers to my questions, but I'm guessing that many of you on this council could answer them all, but not without revealing secrets and corruption. I would like to end my open public comments with one word for everyone to go home and think about tonight as you fall asleep. That word is corruption. Search your souls to recognize whether you are participating in corruption of any kind. I am teaching my four-year-old grandson basic principles such as don't lie, don't steal, and treat each other the way you want to be treated. These are basic truths and principles that should be second nature to, a function, to function in a civilized society. Obviously, we're not all taught these principles from an early age because what I have seen from, this, from members of this council is disgraceful. I thank you kindly. Thank you, Mary. Tim Hale. Mr. Hale. Mr. Hale, you are making a personal, uh, this, this is something that you've gone beyond what we uh, will allow and I'm, ask, I'm going to ask you to move away from personal attacks. You may continue to speak, but you cannot make personal attacks. And to me, what you just said is, is very clear that you make a personal attack on a member of the city council. You need to you know, there's other examples of, of things that you can do, but you cannot make personal attacks. You have to, you can talk about your feelings, your concerns, which uh, has been done today, but we're not going to let you make personal attacks. So, go ahead. I have a floor now. Yes, you do. <clears throat> um, Denny wrote, you know what I'm afraid of, white guys with guns. Mr. Harrington, Okay, Mr. Hale, I'm going to ask you to cease. I'm, I'm going to ask you to cease. You're using your time to make a personal attack. And I'm going to ask you to take a seat, and we'll have somebody else come up and speak at this time. You're using an individual's name and, you're, and saying things that uh, are not, you know, not in a complimentary or a in a founded way that has... I see, so if it's okay. complimentary... Okay, I'm going to ask you to take a seat, Mr. Hale, and we'll go to the next person. How about I, I eliminate the name? Would that be satisfied? I've already asked you to, to cease doing that, and Mr. Hale, I'm going to ask you to take a seat. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I'm going to ask you to take a seat, and we'll go to the next person. If I eliminate the names, you have already, you have already, well, We've already told you not to make personal attacks, and you went right back to making personal attacks, so we're not going to let that continue. Okay, I just told you I won't use names. You continue to refer to something you said previously, and so I, you know, that's, Mr. Hale, you know what you're doing, and it's, it's not, it's not in, in the best interest of the community by making personal attacks on, on an individual. You can do it, you know, you can do it in, in many, many other ways, but not using this forum to do that. I believe you know what you're doing also, and you're censoring my freedom of speech. I am not. You have, you have guidelines. Yet. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hale. Point of order, Your Honor. We, City Council does not have the opportunity to respond to slanderous attacks, so it is reasonable to not allow slanderous attacks. And, Thank and you. That was covered at the beginning. Thank you. Uh, City Clerk. Hey, Caleb Hyen. Caleb, welcome. I'm not seeing him on Zoom tonight. All right, we'll go to the next person. Okay, John Shapley. <coughs> Yeah, I've got these for the 
name's John Shapley. I'm a taxpaying citizen of Laramie. I find your comments to Mr. Hale amusing because on October 6th, if you'll review the record, I never said anyone's name at all. So it was never a personal attack, yet I got the code of conduct for it to be. However, we'll just go on with the rest. I'm here tonight to speak about a few issues I've encountered with this city council. Chief amongst these are censorship, First Amendment infringement, and violation of the council's own code of conduct. The first thing I wish to touch on is code of conduct violations. When others were disrupted, the council was lax to stop the disruptions. When the proceedings were completely interrupted during my speaking time in the past, it took an extraordinary amount of time and my plea to have you take action regarding this infraction. When I made comments about a public official, which were misconstrued as a personal attack, he's a public official and I never said a name, I was interrupted by another council member. This was a direct violation of the code of conduct by a member of the council. Has this council read the parts pertaining to them? Why has Mr. Weaver not been censored or reprimanded for his gross violation? Okay, Mr. Is Mr. Point of order, Mr. Mayor. Here we go again. Yeah, here we go. Right. Mr. Weaver okay, we using, interrupted my comments we are using, he not to respond to a direct comment. I have already, I've already... It wasn't even in his direction. Point of order, Mr. Mayor. I'm raising the point of order with the chair. Mr. Shapley, could you pause for a moment? We sure, have a I'll point of order. Sure, I'll pause as long as my time's paused. It's paused. It's paused. Uh, Mr. Weaver, do you want to bring up your point of order? I will simply address this, Mr. Mayor. The point of order, when it is raised, and this is a point of order as well, is addressed to the chair, Your Honor, the mayor. It was last week, and it is right now. Mr. Shapley. Mr. Mayor, point of order, the council member is being interrupted by the member of the public while addressing the point of order through the chair. I believe we are witnessing a continued pattern of confrontational tactics with members of the city council. Mr. Mayor, I don't believe we should allow it. It's taking up other members of the public's important time and the public business of the council. Mr. Chaplain, before you start again, I'll give you the same opportunity I gave Mr. Hale. Do not use names and I'm personal attacks. That. You already did that. Okay, I'm beyond it. And I'm, I'm going to ask you. That type of thing. I'm going to ask you to use you know, your time to, to make statements of your concerns, your uh, okay. things that you want to bring before the council for us to work Sweet. on. Okay, go ahead. Second issue is censorship. I was censored from the meeting both on October 6th and October 13th when they were published. Why? The interruption by LHRN was also edited prior to the recess being called. This is a blatant violation of the Open Meetings Act Section 16-4-403D, which states, no meeting shall be conducted by electronic means or any other form of communication that does not permit the public to hear, read, or otherwise discern meetings, discussion, contemporary communications outside a meeting, including but not limited to sequential communications among members of an agency, shall not be used to circumvent the purposes of this act. This is referring specifically to the shenanigans with YouTube. It is amazing that technical difficulties only occur when Expedia and favorable to the council. Nothing was done to correct the issue until there was public outcry. Sunshine laws were enacted for a very good reason, to stop actions such as these. <coughs> Why does this council feel that they are above the law? Are other council members complicit when they remain silent? And you'll find time. Thank you, Mr. Shapley. City Clerk. Uh, Billy Eckhard. Honorable Mayor, Council Members, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Billy Eckhart. I'm a Wyoming native and a resident of Laramie, and I'm a taxpaying citizen and a small business owner. Today I want to leave with the words of Abraham Lincoln's famous speech at Gettysburg. In a tribute to all the lives lost in battle, he begins, Fourscore and seven years ago, fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. He finishes with, that we are, high, that, that we are highly resolved that these dead shall not die in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish on this earth. It has become apparent that the people of Laramie, to the people of Laramie, that a personal agenda of one or more council members is interfering with the ability to, re to represent the people wholly, fairly, and justly. 
abuse of authority, censorship, interruptions of public comments, and disregard for the freedoms and liberties given to us is appalling. The Laramie City Council is undermining themselves, allowing double standards, and the silencing of narratives and comments that members don't agree with. That is not a democracy. It was said by one of the city council members that Facebook Live videos were taken down because the comments were, quote, too mean. This is another form of censorship, and I'm here to tell you that if you can't take the heat, then don't run for public office, and for sure, don't for run for re-election if you couldn't handle it in the first term. Not everybody will agree, and it's your role to listen to the people, hear what they have to say, and attempt to come up with, with solutions. Your role is not and should never be for personal gain or the erosion of our liberties. I would also like to mention that the act of the city clerk removing the microphone from the public is yet another form of censorship. Also, walk-on agendas are not how you build the people's trust. Remember, the procedures and code of conduct apply to the city council members as well as to the people. In doing my research of democracy, I came across this article from Klingendale Institute. And I quote, for a democracy to function, it is essential that a government respects the people and takes them seriously. Not only those who have voted for that government, but all people. Furthermore, in order to exercise their democratic rights properly, people should be informed as fully as possible. I would like to close with this. In a world that seems to be divided on all topics, let's remember that Jesus died for all. Thank you. That's your next number. That's not? Okay. All right, thank you. Brenda Whitman. Good Welcome, evening. Brenda. Hi. Um, my name is Brenda Whitman. I've been, lived in Laramie since 1981. I'll be talking about kind of an old issue, but it's near and dear to my heart. Um, this summer, I was appalled that the Police Community Oversight Committee was pushed through under pressure from a small group at the expense of the larger community as a whole. I feel like it takes a lot of nerve to tell our law enforcement professionals how we think they should do their jobs when we have no idea the situations they experience daily. I can't imagine being on the receiving end of the disrespect and combativeness that seem to be the norm in this day and age. As such, I feel our council and city should be providing our officers more support, higher wages, and more vacation time. Instead, our council has chosen to jump on the defunding bandwagon, rendering our police officers powerless, making a mockery of the legal process, and compromising the safety of our community. One of the questions I've had since the beginning was, has anyone asked our police officers for their input regarding proper policing procedures? Um, what better resource than our law enforcement men and women who are in the trenches every day? Another question I've had is, will there be a public education com component to this community oversight committee? It seems apparent that we need to re-educate people on how to act with respect towards officers and that de-escalation of a situation lies not just with the officers, but with citizens as well. It also sounds like we need to re-educate citizens that if you break the law, there will be consequences. And our officer's actual job is to sometimes apply these consequences. These are regular men and women, not beasts, not monsters, doing a job to the betterment of our community as a whole. To see them vilified and not supported has been extremely disheartening. In conclusion, I hope Council has considered a lot of the questions above and that the Oversight Committee has also considered these thoughts and will con continue to consider them as they move forward. Um, that's all. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Brenda. Terry Gillum. Welcome, Terry. Oh, 
now I can see. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor and council members, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Terry Jo Gillum. I've lived in Laramie going on 15 years and a small business owner going on 12 years. I would like to request consideration of the following comments. Transparency is of the utmost concern of the Laramie citizens. Without transparency, this organization is giving the impression of censorship and corruption. There have been recent events of both. Whether this is the intention of the council or not, it is certainly the impression it has given to the general public. It was <coughs> because of this impression I chose to run as a write-in candidate for the City Council Ward 2 during the primaries, just falling short 19 votes of making the ballot. The behavior at last week's meeting during the public comment was unprofessional and out of line. The public and the people who voted for you have every right to know elected officials' stance in regards to issues of public interest. Public officials have very little to zero expectations of privacy. Just look at what is going on with the Amy Coney Barrett hearings. When you make the choice to run for office, you make the choice to have the public eye on your every move, past, present, and future, and held accountable for any movement as it pertains to public interest. You have asked the public for support, donations, and a vote with a promise to represent us with the issues, concerns, and concerns that are important to us. The personal attacks, as you have called them, were mere attempts to inform the public of self-published beliefs of who they have representing our city. Why is Mr. Shapley being treated differently than other people or groups who have singled out other council members in the past few months? We the people would like the understanding of the double standards being posed by the council. The attempt to censor these comments with technical difficulties not once but multiple times is a violation of the Wyoming Open Meetings Act. Accountability and transparency are not unreasonable requests. The public deserves an explanation as to the so-called technical difficulty, difficulties that have incurred the last few weeks and what this body's plan it is to rectify. According to the City of Laramie Rules of Procedure and Code of Conduct of City Council, regular meetings and special meetings, including emergency meetings of the City Council or public meetings under the provisions of the Wyoming statutes. Also, in the same chapter, it states that all meetings shall be recorded from opening to adjournment. We would also like to request that the actual date of the meeting be part of the title of the video so that the simple search of the video can be more easily performed. I close with this. The U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that any public comments during any public meeting of any government body constitutes public forum. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Maximus Bussari. Not seeing him on Zoom. Maximus requ requested to speak at the final okay. public comment period. Zoom. Maximus, if you'd like to speak at this time, go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. I did not know that uh, I was uh, selected as part of the lottery system. I believe that there were others ahead of me. Nevertheless, um, I spoke to you a couple of months ago, and uh, I brought up the subject that your actions have, in so many ways, you yes. Yeah, this is not. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. I had an interruption, so if I can reserve my time, we would appreciate that. Maximus, uh, go ahead. We'll see if there's any noise that we can eliminate. There's a bit of uh, echo. As I mentioned earlier, um, I spoke to you a few months ago, and it was really out of being compelled to bring up the subject that uh, your actions as a council had to legitimize uh, the credibility of the body itself, and you needed to do something about it. Unfortunately, what I have seen so far, it has only aggravated the situation, and you're seeing it based on the outpouring of the public to let you know that uh, it is not okay. I don't understand 
how you can hold yourself to a standard that is above and beyond what the Supreme Court has ruled, specifically in regards to public figures. If you need more protection, I would highly suggest that you step down from the council as a public figure and decide that somebody else may want to represent uh, the interests of the citizens of the Laramie. Because at the very heart of this issue is really a First Amendment and is the rec recognition of the fundamental importance of the free flow of ideas and opinions on matters of public interest and concern. The freedom to speak one's mind is not only an aspect of individual liberty, and I invite each one of you at the council to really understand that, and perhaps maybe the city attorney can give you a tutorial on what it means to be a public official and what kind of protection you're afforded. Because what was mentioned is not part of it, okay? And it is an essential common quest, the freedom of speech, for truth and vitality of society as a whole. As I mentioned, the U.S. Supreme Court has had many cases, the seminal cases that you may recognize is New York Times versus Sullivan, and then it's Jerry Falwell versus Larry Flint of the Hustler fame. And the U.S. Supreme Court has been particularly vigilant to ensure that individual expression of ideas remain free from governmentally imposed sanctions. It's a sacrosanct right. The First Amendment envisions that the sort of robust public debate that you're seeing and that takes place in a democracy will occasionally yield speech critical of public figures who are intimately involved in the resolution of important public questions or by reason of their fame. Maximus, your three minutes have ended. Thank you for your comments. City Clerk. Hey, uh, Dr. Haynes. Welcome, Dr. Haynes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Thank you for your service. I'm here to speak about your service under the Constitution. I want to speak about this oversight board. I guess it's been in panel. I caution you that it's unconstitutional with this exception. It only has the right to be an advisory board or an oversight board to report to you. It has no administrative authority whatsoever. And the chief of police as the executive has no obligation to obey any other suggestions or anything of that nature. Under the Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, we are guaranteed a representative form of government. This oversight board is not elected. You are. You are the oversight board. You are constitutionally mandated and constitutionally authorized to oversee all city agencies, including the one that has the right for deadly force. Now, as to your oath to serve and protect and to keep us safe, it has been noted that there is a member who has views contrary to that. And those are certainly his personal, private views. He has every right to that. But they disqualify him as a public servant. And therefore, under the protection of 42 U.S. Code Section 1983, I've respectfully asked Mr. Brian Harrington to resign from this board Mr. and to not run for public office. Mr. Hayes. Thank you. We appreciate your comments, but I'm going to remind everyone, do not make personal attacks. Let's go to the next. Uh, okay. uh, Laura Francis. She's on Zoom. She's on. Laura, if you hit star six, you'll unmute yourself. Let's go ahead to the next person. We'll come back okay. to Laura before we end. Uh, Jesse McGregor. no comment on non-agenda items. Um, Laura, were you able to uh, unmute yourself? If so, go ahead and speak.
When I began, I said we'd end at 7.10, at 7.11, so we're going to end this uh, period of public comments. We want to thank all those that are making public comments. Um, and we'll work together on making sure that everyone feels like that their First Amendment rights are being protected and observed, and that's, I think, the desire, my desire and the desire of our council to make sure <coughs> everyone has the right to do that. And again, within the guidelines of public comments, uh, as had been discussed. Okay, we're now going to go back to the uh, agenda as it's been published. And we're going to begin with the vice mayor taking us through the considerations of changes in the agenda and setting the agenda. Thank you, Mayor. I would move that the agenda be set as submitted. Second. Been moved and seconded by Councillor Schuster. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so our agenda has been set. We'll, we uh, do not have any public hearings, presentations, or proclamations. And so uh, I'll ask our city manager, do you have any announcements? Um, Mayor, there are no staff announcements other than the recognition of our employee of the month. All right. Would you do the do that monthly staff recognition? So Absolutely. I'm manager. very, very happy to um, tell you about our um, what we call a rock star for September, which is effectively an employee of the month. Um, unfortunately, this individual is not with us tonight. Um, but we'd like to recognize them nevertheless. Um, so our September recognition goes to Officer Chip Cirillo of the Laramie Police Department. Um, he was nominated by the Assistant City Manager, Todd Feaser. Uh, Todd may want to add something at the end, so I'll reserve some time for him. Um, Officer Cirillo was noted by Assistant Chief Terry as always being willing to help out, obviously a skill that we we, we like to have in all of our employees and certainly in our sworn law enforcement. Um, Mr. Cirillo has been with the Laramie Police Department since 2015 after um, previous law enforcement experience and also service in the United States Air Force. Um, with LPD, he is on patrol. He's also a member of our special response team uh, and he is an instructor and trainer, which is one of the uh, duties that he really enjoys performing. Um, in addition to instructing law enforcement on how to conduct their duties, he also teaches civilian firearms classes for the general public. Um, one thing I'd like to share about Chip and that he shared with the rest of our staff this month was that to him, law enforcement is more than just a job. That's a quote. Um, he says he feels like he's a guardian of this community and this is a community that he loves. Um, and he talked about the opportunities to serve that are maybe a little bit outside of the normal law enforcement duties, um, specifically mentioning the police department, little known fact, but they often take meals to homeless people who are maybe literally sleeping under the bridges under I-80 and those kinds of things. Um, so Chip pointed that out as one of those opportunities to serve and one of the things that he really loves about his job. Um, in general, Officer Cirillo just has a great attitude and a very high compassion for other people, and we are thrilled to have him with us and have him in service to the community and to Laramie. Um, if Mr. Fieser wants to add something, it's all yours. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Janine, Honorable Mayor, City Council. I got the chance to spend some time with Chip during EVO training, and you know, oftentimes when law enforcement sends you acronyms, you're kind of not sure what exactly that is. Emergency Vehicle Operation. Um, they were doing some training out at the Laramie, future Laramie and Municipal Operations Center, and I headed out there. And he was working with two of the younger officers on emergency vehicle operation. And you could just see in his body language and his demeanor and his care and his compassion for what he was doing and for those two young officers to make sure that they were better, that I couldn't resist but nominate him to be the rock star. Unbeknownst to me, he tossed me the keys and he said, you're ready to go? So I got to do EVO training also. But uh, as we spent that time in the vehicle, and he was so cautious and so courteous and so kind and so instructive, I think we're blessed at the City of Laramie to have an officer that does training like that to make sure that our officers are well trained and they function, and he's well deserving of the Rock Star of the Month nomination. Thank you both. We certainly appreciate our officers and the police department, fire department, all those that serve the public. You do a wonderful job. Thank you for that. 
recognition and now we'll go to the council are there any members of the council that have any items that they would like to disclose that they have a conflict of interest in uh, at this time seeing none we'll go back to our vice mayor to take us through the approval of the consent agenda Thank you, Mayor. I would move that the consent agenda be approved, that each specific action on the consent agenda be approved as indicated. Second. It's been moved and seconded by Councilor Doherty. Um, could we have roll call on approval of the consent agenda? Harrington? Yes. McKinney? Yes. O'Doherty? Yes. Pierce? Yes. Schuster? Yes. Stalder? Yes. Weaver? Yes. Gabriel? Yes. And Shumway? Yes. That's nine yeses, zero noes, Your Honor. All right, thank you. The consent agenda has been approved. We now move to the regular agenda. Uh, the first item on the regular agenda is item number 11. I've asked Vice Mayor Gabriel to <clears throat> introduce that to us. Once again, thank you, Mayor. This is original ordinance on first reading. Original ordinance number 2017 creating section 15.24.015 of the Laramie Municipal Code, establishing general contractor licensing within the city of Laramie. Introduction and first reading. You need to read the rest. Yeah, you have to take the paragraph down. Make the motion. Oh yes, I'm sorry. I, I move that Laramie City Council approve original ordinance number 2017 Creating section 15.24.015 of the Laramie Municipal Code, establishing general contracting licensing within the city of Laramie on first reading and introduction. Is there a second? I yes, second, second, Mayor. Okay, it's been moved and seconded by Councillor Pierce. Um, we will now have someone from our staff give us. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Council Members. I'm Clarice Hoff, Clarice. Code Administration Supervisor, and I'm bringing forth the, re uh, the ordinance regarding general contracting license. The state of Wyoming does not license general contractors. This does fall on the local jurisdictions. Laramie sits in a pocket of not licensing general contractors, but the surrounding municipalities and jurisdictions, they do. Uh, Cheyenne, Fort Collins, Larimer County, Casper, Rollins, they do license their general contractors. The intent of this is not to be a burdensome to the general contractors. It is to provide fair and consistent licensing practices, elevate the standards, provide the community the ability to identify the licensed general contractors. And it also benefits the homeowners that the general contractors work for because the general contractors, part of their licensing would be providing liability insurance. Sometimes the homeowner does not realize that they could be liable if something would happen with their homeowner's insurance. So the insurance is kind of a big deal regarding the general contractor's licensing. The goal is to develop an effective and efficient and fair general contractor license process and practices with the necessary basic requirements and standards. Currently, we license the trade contractors, such as plumbing, mechanical, electrical, even lawn sprinkler uh, contractors. This would be bringing the general, contract, general contractors in line with that licensing. The reason that I'm bringing this forward is because I receive many calls from the community, from customers of general contractors wanting to know if they're licensed. And when I say no, we as a city of Laramie do not license general contractors, then the discussion becomes why. They license another, how do I know this is a good contractor? So that is one of the reasons I'm bringing this forward. 
The other reason is even more important, I think, or is equally important, I should probably say, is I've been approached throughout several years by actual general contractors wanting a licensing program in the city of Laramie. So when this was presented and discussed, the approach that code administration decided to take was to work with the general contractors as a partner in developing the general contracting licensing. So the first step that I took was I did some research and reviewed the surrounding jurisdictions, the general contracting license requirements and practices that they, they have in place. And then I drafted a proposal of general contracting license requirements and processes to present to the general contractors that was a little more, was set up and geared more for Laramie. Um, in some cases, just not quite so far down in the weeds as other municipalities or licensing, but something that would be effective for the city of Laramie. So um, the, I set up round tables. The first round table was on March 3rd, 2020. We met at 6.30 in the morning, taking into consideration the time of the contractors, because their time is money. So we met at 6.30 in the morning. And at the first round table, we had a draft of agenda that we went over, contracting application, uh, qualified supervisor of record, fees and insurance. After a discussion, and I would say we were probably met for about an hour and a half, those things were agreed upon with the majority consensus. There was about 12 contractors that joined out of the 30. The second con uh, round table was presented on June 24th, again at 6.30 in the morning. Um, there was approximately 10 contractors at that one, and we discussed penalties, um, grandfathering, uh, penalties went rather quickly. Um, they had pretty substantial penalties for those that weren't licensed that they were requesting. Grandfathering in was probably the longest discussion. And there were some that were opposed, uh, that were opposed not to grandfather existing contractors in. Much discussion became of that, and the consensus was from that second round table was to be fair and consistent across the board, and that they wanted to remove the term grandfather in and um, have a time period that the general contractors could become licensed um, and the time period would be to the first renewal which would be 1231 of 2021. Um, mainly because all contractors are not at the same level nor do they want to do the same scope of work that a class A that would be doing commercial and residential full commercial um, would be as someone that is maybe just interested in doing residential building. So um, in review and research, other municipalities and since we adhere to the International Code Council, we adopt those codes and go by those. Um, I set up the class for general contractors and the qualified supervisor of record to mirror what the testing would be uh, at the International Code Council level. Now, these are also tests that other jurisdictions require for their licensing. So the benefit to the contractors that are licensed, say in Cheyenne, they're gonna already have had to take that test so that test they've already had and would be able to get licensed here or vice versa if this ordinance goes through and pass. It's a benefit for Laramie contractors because then they've got that test and it opens up a wider field for them as well. Um, and I will admit that was a, a long discussion. It was about an hour, but the consensus from those that attended um, felt the best way was um, 
to be consistent and fair is to move forward with the licensing with the um, qualified supervisor of rec record providing a test um, obtained through the International Code Council or the equivalent with a pass. The third round table was July 21st. It was at 6 a.m. That one was a little bit tougher, um, but we made it. There was about eight that attended. Uh, final draft was presented and uh, the consensus was to begin the process of bringing it to the council in an ordinance form. After each round table, I sent out an email with what was discussed and the draft of the changes. So before the round table, they were, they were sent out what the agenda was, what was going to be discussed, and then a follow-up email went out as well. Um, the service and benefit to the community of Laramie is having some standards and a process for general contracting license. We've been licensing the trade contractors, plumbing, mechanical, and electrical for a lot of years. The scope and the responsibility of general contractors are very broad. They orchestrate the trade contractors. They are in charge of the whole project and they have a lot of responsibility and a lot of respect. And the responsibility for that scope of the project is the primarily health and safety and welfare for our community of good building practices. Um, and that is how we got to this point. We, and I kept the contractors sent out as we move forward with final drafts with the ordinances for, um, for them to see and it not be a shock. Um, I felt it was very important that we work with general contractors. It affects them. It's not my intent or code administration's intent to be a burdensome on the contractors but to have some accountability and a good general contracting licensing process and practice and with this product that was submitted in your packets is a collaboration with the general contractors that took the time to participate in the round table events Clarice, is that what you wanted to introduce? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Now, I, Council, we're going to ask you to ask questions regarding this uh, uh, proposal to, to uh, license general contractors. I will note for you that there's 15 to 20 individuals that have asked to make public comments. So this, this discussion will be fairly broad. And uh, if you feel like that you have some questions you want to begin with, we'll start with council questions and then we'll move on to the public. Uh, Clarice, are you ready to answer the questions that come? Yes, sir. Okay, let, let's start with that. Uh, council, any questions you have for Ms. Hoff? Let's start with uh, Councilor Doherty and then we'll go to Councilor Schuster. Thank you for your thoroughness of including the public. That's reassuring. and. Uh, when you said you sent out the emails after every round table, is that to just all the contractors you knew about in Laramie? Is that how you it's figured that out? The e well, the emails that I had, and basically from the general contractors that had pulled permits within the last year or so. Right. Um, That's there's a lot of contractors that work out in the county um, that occasionally may come in. Um, and then... Um, so the so I had a list of about 30 36 that it went out. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Schuster. I have a couple so um, so we're we're putting a program together and I see the income it would bring in and uh, the price that it would cost us. So this program is going to lose approximately a little over $33,000 a year to implement. No sir. I'm not sure where that number's coming from. Um, but this, but this, 
This actually, the general contracting license is going to mirror the trade contractor licensing that's already in progress. And the cost of the trade contractor license is maybe $3,000, so I don't see the total contracting license even coming up to that. That initial income that it's going to generate off of new contractors that I estimated off my general contracting list, and it was me going through the list, um, taking a look at what they might be um, licensing as, uh, whether they're a general A or a class A, class B, class R, class C. So the general contracting license fees that the revenue would bring is 43350 Now that's an estimate. That would be new contractor licensing. And then projected renewal general contracting licensing fee would run about 14700 So there really isn't any cost to licensing general contractors except time and paper. Um, I would say the most expensive thing are the little sleeve cards that I laminate for the general, the, well, currently, that I laminate for the trade contractors. Okay, I see my mistake. Anticipated revenue for its first year was 53.050, and then renewal, and I thought maybe that was what we were expecting to come in, but that'd be the second year, because I saw that we're charging a fee for the first year to sign up and then it goes down after that correct and that 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 mirrors what we have in place now with the trade contractors as well and um so that initial new fee i apologize for that is a new fee for um for them being a new contractor license as well as a new license for the qualified supervisor so anything that anybody if they roof their house, if they do a remodel in the house, if they have to pull the building permit, this can only be done by a licensed contractor? No, sir. Just like the trade contractors, if you are the homeowner and it is your primary residence, then you can do the work yourself. So if you are a homeowner and a primary residence, you can pull the building permit, you can do the electrical, you can do the plumbing, and you can do the mechanical. This would only be contractors that are working on on someone else's property that's kind of what i meant though i'm mm -hmm. sorry and, then and so I, basically the contracting license that is set forth covers anything that we permit for mm -hmm. and then if you i see there's several different layers of contractors so if you're a supervisor or contractor and you have 10 employees only the supervisor must have the license the 10 employees don't correct so for example you may be um sole proprietor contractor you might be the only you don't maybe you don't have employees yep. so you are going you know depending on what your your qualified super of record what kind of contractor you want to be you would take the test for that and you're and you're qualified and you go um so you would only have to the qualified super is for represents the entity the business now you have other contractors that have several projects that are going on so they will have foremans or project managers whatever the term is but they will only need to have that one qualified supervisor that that needs to be licensed as the master of record for on their contractors license that can be available within a 24-hour period if there would be an issue or a problem that the foreman or ma uh, project manager couldn't answer. Thank you very much. Vice Mayor Gabriel. Thank you, Mayor. I was just curious, in your meetings with the contractors, could you discuss some of the adjustments that you made? Maybe some of the comments that came in that said, this is not going to work and this will work. In, in all of the meetings you had with the contractors? Well, it was a pleasure to work with the contractors, I do have to say, and I learned and gained a lot of knowledge and um, a lot of respect for what they do. I, for most of my adult life, I have been in somewhat in the construction industry. I was amazed that 
There was no discussion on the fees that was presented. When I, I needed a starting point, and so I started out with a rough draft, looked at what surrounding areas were presenting, what they were charging, and tried to hit somewhere in the middle realistically, thinking that this will start the discussion. There really wasn't any discussion on the fees. They felt they were um, very reasonable. I had one general contractor that did feel that they should be higher. The penalty and the insurance, when we discussed the insurance, there again, they all felt that that was very reasonable and in line with what they have seen elsewhere. When um, we did get to the penalty phase, um, I had like a $500 penalty fee if you weren't licensed, and that did change. What they did want to see is if, um, and I apologize, I don't remember offhand what, um, so a Class A license is 500 new. What they recommended for a penalty was $1,000. The second time it would be $2,000, and the third time it would be $4,000. So they had very stiff penalties that they wanted to impose on general contractors that were coming in and not being general uh, licensed. And what was presented to you is there really shouldn't be a second or third time if you are working without, just like with the trades, electrical, plumbing, mechanical, lawn sprinkler, refrigeration. If you're working without a license, you are working illegally and you must stop work because you couldn't pull a permit. So those type of things would apply to this as well. So there really shouldn't be a first or second time. And that's where you see the adjustment of $750. They have a 72-hour period, I believe, um, to start the process of getting their general contracting license or a $750 fee is imposed. And of course, there would be a work stop order at that point because they would be working illegally where they wouldn't have a permit and they would not be licensed. And then one final thing, how widespread is licensing of general contractors from your experience? From my experience, um, from what I gathered from this state, most of your cities our size and larger are licensing general contractors. Um, I've had general contractors when this first was starting um, tell me that they were glad to see this moving forward because they actually thought about licensing in Rollins um, so that they had a general contractor's licensing number to give to the bank and to insurance companies. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Harrington. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Clarice, how much did you say this program will um, estimated cost annually? After maybe the first year, I think would be the more important number. The cost annually? Um, for cards and paper and stuff, it is going to be less than $5,000. And I apologize, I have that number, but I don't believe I have it with me. But with the um, trade contractors, it runs well, probably right at $2,500, $3,000. So that's why I say it's the cost of it, not, I mean, time, I'm just talking about materials. And um, the biggest cost is probably the laminating cards that we laminate the cards with. And, um, and then the paper. I send out renewal cards. Um, we are right at probably about 700 individuals with subcontractor individual licensing and right at 300 subcontractor licensing. So right at 1,000 at this point and I anticipate if this moves forward, renewal letters won't have to go out this year, but next year we're probably looking probably at 12, 1300. Thank you. And Mr. Mayor, could I ask one other question? Sure, go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, I, I'm curious if you are, I, I mean, I know one of the, I'm curious if maybe you can shed a little light on the size of contracting companies that participated in the round tables. Um, if it was sort of a, a smattering of, of all-sized companies, um, 
or not, because I, I can certainly see more interest in a larger company um, having something like this in place. Smaller companies with the already um, sig significant barriers to entry. I'm just curious if they, they participated in that part, and if not, if the conversation might have been different, certainly revolving around uh, the, the pricing. Um, the contractors that participated would, I would say, two of them I know do commercial as well as residential, and I mean commercial as in structural, not as in the class B where it would be commercial non-structural. Um, several m residential that cross over into the commercial non-structural, and several, several that are, that were that primarily do residential. Um, my biggest concern is, was the class R. And I, we really, um, I was very conscientious regarding the class R, because I know that that is hitting um, the handymen um, that come in and, and, and the handymen. But you're still, having the health and safety of your customer and their family. And so that's one of the reasons why the testing kind of, it kept coming back to the testing and being fair and consistent in that, that there needed to be a general basic knowledge of what the codes were and what the building practices are and good building practices. You asked me earlier in regards to um, some of the comments. One of the comments, and we see this a lot, and there's really nothing that we can do at code administration. If somebody comes in and says, I'm a general contractor, and I'm going to fill out this permit, I can't stop them. If they provide me with what they need, what, with what we need as far as plans and construction documents, we have to move forward with it, even if you have that sick feeling in your stomach, this is not going to go well. Um, and one of the comments that was made is that they see the contractors made a comment, well, not just one, but several comments that just because you have a pickup, a black lab, a level, and a hammer, and your tool case does not make you a general contractor. And we do see a lot of that. Um, and they were, not, they were not being facetious in that. They've all worked in the trade. They respect the trade. They grew in the trade. And the contractors that are there, and my experience with contracting, is there's a lot to learn. You don't learn it over a summer or a year or two. It is working under a master general contractor and learning the different trades the framing, the drywalling. Uh, way back in the day, the general contractor literally did it all, from the foundation and footings clear up to the finish work. Now it's more specialized, and it, it takes a lot of years to learn that and have a respect for that. And it isn't something you just learn over a couple of years. Thank you, Clarice. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Stalder. Thank you, Mayor. Um, one of the questions I had, you mentioned cost in terms of, you know, laminating the little card. Do you foresee any cost in terms of enforcement of this or? Enforcement? That's actually already in place. I believe council has already passed that, that we have, um, code administration does have the ability to write up a violation ticket. And that's where the $750 come in. And at that point, it does become a civil matter, and they will be appearing in municipal court. Okay. But do you see those occurrences increasing in the time? You know, I, I imagine there are some contractors that really want this ordinance, um, and some that don't. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you really want this ordinance, and you're working on a house, and you see your some guy working on a house down the street that you know isn't licensed, I think this sets up kind of like a mechanism of. I don't want to say tattling, that's not the right word. But. Well, the, to your point, um, one of the things that is required is that your building permit and or inspection card be visible. Okay. So it isn't a matter of general contractors tattling on others. It is a matter that the, license, the building permit 
and the inspection card for new construction major remodel is on site and is visible. That is something that the general contractors did ask for to be indicated and acknowledged on the application. So as a qualified supervisor, they're going to be acknowledging that one, they are hiring licensed trade contractors with the city of Laramie and that their sub building contractors are carrying insurance that they are that they have and that the building permit and inspection card be visible. And those were requests from the general contractors. Thank you. Can I ask just a couple other thoughts? Can you give me an idea of what the cost is to get licensed for the contractor? The cost for the contractor, if you're a class A and you're qualified supervisor, the new is going to be two, or I'm sorry, the class A is going to be $500 and your um, all qualified supervisors, it's $100 new, $50 renewal, class A uh, would be, so that would be $600 new and uh, $250 for renewal for a class A and then it would go down from there. I can, if you want me no, to, no, I can thank go you. through that gives, one that of them. I just idea. took the highest. That gives me an idea. I just have one more question if that's okay. Um, have there been a lot of problems that um, merited this? I get calls at least once a week. Usually, I mean, usually it's from a customer that is concerned either regarding is this contractor licensed or this contractor is telling me I don't need a license, but they're going to be cutting a hole in my wall to put in a window. Okay. So, I mean, those are a couple examples, but yes, I, we do receive calls regularly in regards to that. And then, like I said, it usually generates a conversation of why does Laramie not license general contractors and... I just say currently at this time we don't license general contractors. Thank you for your answers. You Other questions from council? Councillor Weaver and then we'll go back to Councillor Schuster. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, through you, I wonder if we might, uh, the council might hear um, an instance of one of the difficult insurance situations that has arisen from a homeowner property owner using an unlicensed contractor. That was uh, touched on in the beginning of the presentation on this matter. I wonder if um, we could hear just a little bit more about a specific instance or perhaps a couple of instances where that has been an issue for Laramie residents. Thank you, can, Mr. Mayor. Um, Honorable Mayor, Council Member. Um, yes, I can. We had to do a courtesy inspection, which is something normally our inspections are done by permitted work. We had um, a, a young woman call and she was very upset because she had hired a contractor. She was calling to see actually if he was licensed with the city of Laramie. And um, she had had damage to her home. She had hired this contractor. The work was subpar and the insurance company was having issues with paying for the work. Um, she had paid the contractor, and so there, there's a situation where a permit wasn't pulled. There were no regular inspections on the work that was being done, the framing. Um, it was covered up with drywall plaster, um, but the work was subpar, and unfortunately, he was paid. He's gone, and now she's having to deal with her insurance. Mr. Mayor, I'm just going to um, assume that that's simply one instance of many that could be shared. Okay. Councilor Schuster? Is there a cost for the test? Um, there is through the ICC. Um, okay. I believe it is right around $150. Okay. That's my only question. There is a cost for the test. Thank you. <clears throat> Before we go to the public, any other questions from the council?
All right. Uh, I have a list of individuals that have asked to make public comment, uh, general comments on this general contractor licensing. And I'm going to go down through this list that we've received this because this has been uh, randomly uh, prioritized. Now, the first public comment is from Jesse McGregor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and I'd like to start out by acknowledging Clarice and her efforts to uh, involve the public and the contractors and really get a, a census of the people within the industry. She, in my opinion, has gone above and beyond um, to include everybody who wished to be included. That being said, um, just to touch on a couple things that were mentioned in the comments uh, previous to this, firstly being um, there's a lot of talk about the fees and the cost to the contractor. Uh, my feeling is that all those fees are very, very reasonable, um, and they do not present any form of a hurdle for anybody qualified within this field to enter into a general contracting position. Secondly, I think that the uh, general contracting licensing is a protection not only for the people of Laramie and the, uh, the, the customers, so to speak, but also it's a protection to uh, the, the contracting field in and of itself. Um, every municipality I can think of off the top of my head, Casper, Douglas, Cheyenne, Rollins, we've gone through them. This is pretty standard practice and it's pretty standard uh, throughout the nation. And this testing is nothing that uh, presents a problem for any qualified individual. The test itself is an open book test. Um, takes minimal amount of studying. It just takes the time and wherewithal to choose to do it. Um, this by no stretch of the imagination will get rid of all bad contractors or all uh, individuals who maybe shouldn't be in the field. It's a pretty small hurdle, but it will separate the wheat from the chaff um, right out of the gate. And I'm very much for uh, having licensing for the city of Laramie. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jordan Lindstrom. Grant Lindstrom. Uh, I'm Grant Lindstrom. I don't have big concerns about this other than I'm a little concerned with, we talk a lot about affordable housing and this is gonna be one more hurdle. But my concern is there'll be people that won't come because they're not licensed and not because they're not good. And I don't think there's a lot of cases where we have a lot of bad contractors. We're in a size of city that if you do bad work, your name gets out pretty dang fast and you don't have much happen. So I think there is occasional things that happen, but I don't think it's widespread. I don't think we have a widespread problem where we have a lot of bad contractors that are doing bad work and they're just sneaking in and sneaking out. I don't think that's the case at all. I think we have a lot of really good contractors. Uh, but the problem a little bit of is just supply and demand. It's one more hurdle. And so you have people coming and helping and I have contractors that come from out of town if they got to go through and do some more licensing to come into Laramie, they just won't come because they don't, they don't need to. They got to travel anyway. So I think it's going to be a burden there. I, I only attended and I was on Zoom one of the one of the roundtables, but I, I think who was really un underrepresented. There wasn't anybody that was uh, that I knew there that was any kind of a the ones that do remodels, the roofing guys, the, the, the one classification. There was nobody there on that that had any say whatsoever on any of that. So the big contractors were there and, and probably the medium sized contractors were there, but nobody at the lower end was there that I saw in the one I was at. And, and I, don't, I don't know that they were even sent because you're a roofing guy and now to do roofing you have to be that. They don't pull permits like that. So they wouldn't be on Clarice's list to send to because they don't get a building permit. So they, they do contractor for the, they would do work for the, but according to the thing, they got to be licensed now to do that. So that, 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 that side of it, I think is, is underrepresented, I guess, on comments. My, and I, I just, I, I don't see a need for it. I think it's one more way to make $20,000 for the, for the city 
with very little effort, but that's, that, and I guess from your perspective, that's a good thing. Uh, I think it's a little bit, uh, I don't think it's a, that useful, and I think it's gonna hamper supply and demand. I think costs will go up because you won't be able to get people to come in that don't wanna do it. And, and you, you talk about other cities around, most of those, if you get out of Wyoming, they're state licensed. And so, you know, if you, if you start working here, it's not so much because they're 50 miles apart, but other places, if, you're, if you license in every city, even if it's 500 per city, you might be in 15 cities. I mean, that's a lot of money. So here it's not so much because of distance, but uh, other places where there's lots of communities, there are state licenses for uh, general contracting and the trades. I was in Utah before here, and that, that's a state license. And that makes a lot of sense there because of the number of communities in that. But I, I, I don't know. I don't see a huge need for it. And I, so that's my comment. Thank you, Mr. Lindstrom. Clarice, go ahead. Yes. I just need to clarify a couple of things. In our discussions, the trade contractors that already are going through a licensing process, our plumbing, our mechanical, and electrical, those are licensed through the city of Laramie. The sub-building contractor, the subcontractors that work under the building application with the general contractor, your drywallers, your masonry, they are not being licensed in this general contracting license. For the primary reason of so many of them coming in to keep the costs down, that it's hard enough to get those masonaries, the drywallers, the tapers in to um, do that work. So they're not licensed, they're not being considered for licensing at this time. They are being acknowledged by the qualified supervisor that they hold insurance. And the second thing is roofing roofing contractors do pull roofing permits. If they're roofing without a permit, they are roofing illegally. And our, well the new construction would be underneath the general contractor, as it is they, now. Would they have to be licensed though? Nope. To be in Mr. Lidstrom, there. Oh, let's, let's make sure that <clears throat> We don't have back So if it's new audience. construction, just like it is now, if it's new construction, that roofer is working underneath as a subcontractor to the general contractor. If it is a roofing contractor, they're going to be licensed because they're going to be pulling a roofing permit. Under a new construction, that roof, is considered part of that building permit application for the new structure. Okay, thank you, Clarice. All right, the next person I have on my list is uh, Ron Tomasini. Hi, um, I'm actually a small contractor. I own a business that I'm the only employee uh, I build houses in Laramie and I've worked in several other cities and the comment from the last guy about uh, state licensing is very it, there's not a whole lot around I used to work in Colorado Fort Collins Larimer County Loveland Greeley Weld County you had to have a license in any one of those places not a state license to work and so I'd have five licenses in one at one time. The licensing here, pricing, fees, all of that is very reasonable. You know, I don't believe um, it's going to add hardly any money to a house. It's just going to protect homeowners from getting taken if someone does something wrong because they have insurance. Um, I think Clarice has done an excellent job in asking the community to come in and give comment and she put it out to everyone that she had permits from and if people didn't come in to voice their opinion you know it's kind of hard for them to complain. 
because she was listening to what everyone had to say. She wanted to know what the little contractors had to say. And in comparison to most of the guys in the room, I was pretty small. Um, but everyone's opinion mattered. They listened to what I had to say as well as I listened to what they had to say. I think this is a great move for the city if you really are into protecting your citizens. And I don't believe it will add much in the Affordable Housing Act or realm. Uh, I just think that it steps up Laram Laramie to a higher standard and makes the contractors work a little bit harder to please their customers. And that's it. All right. Thank you, Ron. Um, Brandon Aaron Holtz. Not seeing a mayor. Okay. Um, Cliff AC. Hi, I'm Cliff AC. I'm a general contractor in in the area. As on the surface, I don't have a real issue with licensing. I've been in several places where there have been state licenses, like Grant's experience in, in Oregon, in Utah, in Nevada. Um, and I personally think that's the level that ought to come from. It's not the municipal level, but from the state. I'm concerned with some of the same things Grant's concerned with, and I think there's some, some disparity in what in what's being said and what's actually written and I think those ought to be looked at real carefully and and one of the thoughts that came to my mind is you have a roofing contractor that's that would re, be required if he's just doing a roof to be licensed but if he's working under me not what about the stucco guy is he required to be licensed if he's just going and doing the stucco on someone's house. I, I, I think there's, there's still some voids in that whole thing that need to be looked at and filled. Um, I too am concerned with bringing people in from out of the area to do the work and how that affects us because um, I do think it has the propensity to drive prices up in an area where we're already overpriced in, in many ways. And so I'm... <clears throat> I also am concerned about the qualified supervisor that we that we have to have and that so if I if I have a foreman hired or a project management manager hired he's got to take the written test not the general contractor the way the way the ordinance reads um, I'm not sure that's the right way to have that done I, I think there's there's some potential here for for some problems and that I think need to work be worked out a little bit better. Um, it, I, I'm also, I, I was put back a little bit at the beginning of this with all the public comments because some of the discussion I've had with other contractors and subcontractors in the area have been, well, the city's just trying to cram this one through real quietly and, and not communicate it and not, not be upfront with it. And I hadn't heard anything. I accidentally ran into this document yesterday, so it's fairly new to me. And and some of the comments I I heard would support some of the things I heard earlier. And I thought, boy, that that that's a concern overall. So I just think that the city needs to look at this very carefully and, and make sure that what that what they're doing um, is legal, is non-discriminatory, and and works well within within our community I again I don't I don't argue that we might ought to have some kind of licensing um, I've been involved and been licensed in many places so I would I would agree with that thank you thank you mr. AC <clears throat> Tom Matamore welcome Tom. evening mayor councilman as some of you know uh, before I became a shoemaker, I spent 20 years as a steel erection and precast concrete contractor in Albuquerque with a general contracting license. I'm going to go through this quick because I've got some points. As a general rule, I'm in favor of most of this. I think it needs some rewriting and it needs some work. Uh, 
Number one, under section B on your definition, the way this definition reads, you would need a contractor's license to go into somebody's home and install mini blinds. You'd also need one for any kind of a handyman who has to go in and replace a door or replace glass in a window. You have no bottom end to the requirements for a contractor, which basically, as Councilor Harrington said, is a pretty big barrier to entry into the construction market. I started fresh out of the Marine Corps with a pickup truck and a Lincoln Pipeline welder in the back of it, and by the time I got electrocuted and retired from construction, I had 75 men working for me, a forklift and a crane. Some of this might have been a barrier to my entry. Now, we go to the other stuff. I, like I said, I'm in favor of this, but it needs some work. Section E, paragraph 6, seems to require that the city be indemnified or be an insured policy. As a general, well, as for an example, you have to have insurance to go to, uh, to drive a vehicle in this state. You take and you bring your insurance policy or copy of it in when you get your registration. It doesn't say anything about how the state of Wyoming is a certificate holder. What you're doing by making the city a certificate holder on both the uh, liability and the workman's compensation is it implies that the city gets paid if a liability claim is made or if a workman's comp claim is made. So it also is unclear on whether or not subcontractors have to be licensed. I was a subcontractor for most of my time. I had a crane and a forklift. I damn sure needed to know what the hell I was doing and have liability insurance. And I paid a fortune for it. So I've got no problem with that. But it doesn't seem to be clear on whether subcontractors need to be uh, licensed. And you have a QSOR to, on the job. The contractor generally is the one anywhere I've ever been, Arizona, uh, Denver, and New Mexico, it's the principal parties of the corporation or the owners of the business who get the license and have to be the qualified party because they're the ones responsible financially if a building is not built up to code. So what you're doing is you're transferring this responsibility to a salaried or a paid employee. I've got a lot more if you want to go. I'll pass these out if you want to go through it. But in general, the bill needs some rewrite, but it's not that, bad. Not that bad. I've seen worse. Thank you, Mr. Matamor. Thank you for your notes. <clears throat> Next, I have uh, Damon Satake. Russ Spiker Miller. I'm here, but I wasn't going to say anything. Well, you're <laughs> welcome to say something if you want to. You have three minutes. Thank I'm you for coming. I'm here, and uh, frankly, uh, my thought is this is a good idea. Um, I have a lot of subs. I do some commercial work that she's talking about. Um, I vary between 15 and 22 employees, and I have uh, a lot of time in different people's homes. Uh, I'll give you an instance of something that bothers me, that makes me want to have this happen. I walked into a, a lady's house, she's in her late 70s, and uh, she, <laughs> she says, I want you to work on my shower surround. I walk into the shower surround and there's tiles falling off the wall because they're using sheetrock. Anyway, long story short, there's an outlet two inches above the tub that some contractor had just put in there six months before. It's a danger to her life. I mean, it was corroded inside and just looking to start a fire inside of a shower surround. That's the kind of thing that, that I've come across. I'm not going to give you a list of things that have happened, but there's been a number of instances where I've found things that I walk into the door and people have a bad attitude because I'm a contractor and the previous guy that they had worked for him did a lot of things wrong and now I'm here and they're all over me about doing things right. And do you have a license? Well, no, no I don't. You know, there's not one here in, in Laramie, Wyoming. So that's the answer I have to give. And I would love to be able to say, yes, I do have one. Here it is. 
just I think it would eliminate a lot of the dangerous safety issues for families. So, go ahead. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Brad Pop. Welcome, Brad. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Members. Um, I'm Brad Pop, and uh, I'm the owner and operator of Two Rivers Contracting. I've been working in this town for 11 years uh, for myself. Um, I don't have a contractor's license. <laughs> and uh, I'm, one, I'm probably one of the smallest contractors that was in the room that, when we had these meetings. Um, just to address that, um, I think I probably got Clarice's first email. Um, and I've, I've been in there uh, meeting with these guys. And uh, just wanted to come up here and voice my support for the, for the motion. Um, I think uh, to address some of the questions too is some of the safety issues that we run into. Um, I know we can all say a lot of, uh, we've all seen a lot of things, but I had one gal that called me and she had a contractor come in and um, heating guy and he moved her furnace around her hot water heater and uh, he didn't have a license. He did a lot of remodeling structural work. Um, ended up the furnace was drafting carbon dioxide from the hot water heater and their whole family of six was getting carbon dioxide poisoning. And I was recommended to come in and, and we got a permit and we got it done right and we, we fixed it. But uh, we ran into that, we had to fix all the mechanical, had to redo electrical, all the, the buried uh, wire tape connections, all the plumbing that was bad. Um, headers that were rat nailed together falling down on my guys' heads when we were demoing. <laughs> um, so that was probably the worst one I've been a part of, that was two years ago. Um, but I'm, I'm one of the smaller guys, I usually have three to five employees. Um, I do think this would be a good thing for Laramie, be good uh, credibility for our businesses to be able to say, like, like Russ said, that we are licensed and, and know what we're doing. Um, and I think uh, <coughs> one of the things, too, that would help <coughs> is with our employees, I think it would be good for um, encouraging our employees to stay a little bit longer and kind of work under us and learn a little bit more before they go out there. I think what happens, too, is when we lose guys and they start, um, they don't have enough work to sustain what they're doing and they end up getting into stuff that they shouldn't be doing, electrical work and plumbing work because they're there and, uh, and they see it and they see it as an opportunity for work and uh, they think they know what they're doing. And, and that's one of the dangers too. Um, but overall I think it's going to be a good thing for Laramie. Yeah. I think that like Chris said, this has gone out, the email for people that are pulling permits um, and that, uh, and if you've been pulling permits, then you've got the email and you know what's been going on. So uh, that's what I have to say. Thanks. Thank you, Brad. Um, Frankie Spiegelberg. Tom Benson. Like he's on there either. Uh, Joe Thomas. Not on there either, Mayor. Moving right along. Um, Bryce Johnson. Mike Cisneros. I'm right here. Mike, welcome. Thank you. I'm Mike Cisneros. I'm the owner of Rocky Mountain Contracting. Uh, we've been in business for 26 years, and I just want to address a few points. Um, we probably do 80% of our work, our smaller projects, anywhere from a couple of hundred dollars to maybe ten or fifteen thousand dollars in the scope of the terms of projects. We do do some bills that you know are over five hundred thousand dollars, but for the most part, most of our work is small work. And so I just want to point out that the representation at the meeting from the get-go did have people who do small scopes of work. Um, we see a lot of different things that some of these other 
contractors have mentioned um, and quite frankly it's the homeowners that have to be the ones that bear the burden of, of most of these things um, I think that the accountability of the residents of our city have some of the we have some of the strictest requirements for planning in the county and only requirements for plumbers electricians and HVA uh, professionals and no requirements for people doing construction work within the city of Laramie requiring them to be professionals from general contractors to subcontractors for the basic fundamental requirements from International Code Council which includes knowledge and basic life safety standards and proves that an individual or company is competent to perform the task that they are tested for. Our residents are subject to choosing a contractor like playing a hand of cards and I know that this isn't every single contractor because I would probably say 95 percent of the contractors out there are pretty good at what they do but there's a handful of them that the residents of our community have to be subject to because there's no accountability um, I have worked with clients at least once every year that have been subject to tens of thousands of dollars and over a hundred thousands of dollars of loss because they have selected a contractor that lacked integrity a license and sometimes insurance not to mention their loss of their use of their homes and associated attorneys fees this ordinance will help to alleviate that problem I know it's not going to correct it but it's certainly a good step to move forward times have changed and no, not everyone honors a handshake or an agreement slash contract and can be taken for their word as once was the time in a different time although some of these individuals still do exist and do business in our city and their integrity is at the highest standards however it is simply just a few individuals and they too should understand that this is part of being a professional change is inevitable we may be good at some things however we're not good at everything for instance I do not like electronic devices but for my country company to continue to do business we had to adapt I had to adapt to for some of our current contractors in the city of this ordinance they will have to adapt to the change as well I'm not saying that a licensed contractors are better um, mr. Cisneros yes your three minutes are up okay I'll leave this with you and um, okay, hopefully you. you guys can take a look at it thank you for your notes I am a hundred percent in support of this um, one last thing I'd like to say is your license is through International Code Council okay. it's not necessarily through the states or the cities each city you have to go to you have to get a license from that city to be able to operate in that city but your licensure pretty much tells you you can work in any state in the United States Texas has a few different requirements some of the southern states have a few different requirements and California does because of the different things that they deal with hurricanes um, earthquakes things of that nature but your licensure is covered across the board so once you're licensed in one location through International Code Council you can go anywhere thank and you. be licensed thank, thank you very you. much um, Jesse McGuire Arsenio Lamus. Hello? Yes, Arsenio, go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, I, I just have a few things to say. I, you know, in this, in this time of COVID and um, with uh, some small contractors uh, struggling, and uh, and on the flip side, uh, some homeowners not doing so well that have a need to hire contractors and less of ability to pay. It just seems like an untimely um, time to put extra regulations on contractors who are um, wanting to go out and work. You know, the customers out there, they don't have the same money to to pay top dollar for, for, for contractors. And if you have a, a reduced pool of contractors working out there because of extra regulations or extra burdens placed on them so they can go to work every day, um, that just makes it tougher for everyone, I think. 
narrowing the pool at this point in time when um, it just seems a little cruel. I, I think it's a little inconsiderate at this time. I, it just, uh, I think the timing for these new regulations is just bad. And with that, um, I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Arsenio. <laughs> I'm going to go, before we open it up to all those others that are here, we'll give everyone a chance to speak. I'm going to go through the ones that we have on our list that did not respond. And uh, I'll start with, and by the way, I'll go through this list. If any of you there, just start speaking. Frankie Spiegelberg, Tom Benson, Joe Thomas, Bryce Johnson, and Jesse McGuire. Any of you with us? Okay, I'll open this up now to the general public. Anyone in the council chambers that wants to speak, come up, please. Give us your name. And uh, you have three minutes. My name is Michael John Cisneros. I work underneath my dad with Rocky Mountain Contracting. And I plan to take over the business. So I went to college, and it wasn't for me, like a lot of these other contractors out here. And I personally believe that if you are going to choose a lifestyle of contracting work and that's going to be your career for the rest of your life, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to go up and do the studying and testing that you need to do. Um, I have not done mine yet, but I am in the process of studying. And I was not a person who enjoyed book work. But if you've been in the business long enough and you've done a lot of work, I've been in the business for 18 years with my dad, uh, you know, there's stuff that I learn every single day and there's stuff that I've learned in the code book every single day that I acknowledge myself with. And I think that it's really important to give the customers, new homeowners, and everybody else who is willing to buy a house in Laramie the opportunity to make sure things are done right and uh, you know I uh, appreciate your guys' time and I hope you guys look at it from that standpoint thank you thank you Mr. Cisneros anyone else in the council chambers okay those that are with us on the phone any of you would like to speak go ahead and unmute Hitting star six and start talking. Hello, Honorable Mayor. This is Chris Stratton. Um, I, I do have a question in the regards to uh, this bill with people who do installation of um, smart home, those types of applications, and how that would affect. Um, those types of uh, contract labor um, because it, it looks like it's a very broad end on what a handyman can do and definitely broad end on if you're needing full licensure for that uh, that type of situation otherwise I'm very supportive of this uh, bill thank you for your time All right, thank you Chris uh, Mr. Glass, I see you unmuted. Did you want to speak to the to this topic? Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, I, I do. Um, I, I'm very concerned about this. As as you know, I'm I'm a candidate to sit on council, and uh, one uh, and the of, of all of the things that uh, that I've said um, uh, d during during my campaigning for for the seat, um, the thing which has rung true the most with the public is the slogan which I which I've campaigned with, which is um, democracy, not bureaucracy. It really seems to me that the city bureaucracy is really going hog wild this year and trying to impose all sorts of new requirements and regulations. And many of them are just to increase their own power and not necessarily to help the public. Um, this ordinance is like that. If you read the details of it, there are really no consumer protections in it. There's a requirement for insurance, but that doesn't mean that you uh, doesn't mean you don't still have to sue. Um, it's uh, mostly just red tape. It doesn't it, it doesn't really have any serious protections. 
It also doesn't, st uh, uh, contrary to what's been said in some of the discussions, it doesn't stop individual contractors who are dishonest or do bad things. Um, it only affects general contractors, and I think it's important to distinguish between those two roles. Um, they've been blurred in this discussion. Um, this will increase the cost of, of, of hiring a general contractor to, to do a job or, or to coordinate a job. And uh, it, it contains a requirement that they uh, sign an agreement which, uh, they, where they just agree to do what's already been required by the law and doesn't really, again, add any, adding, adding any new protections. Um, it's, uh, now, I understand that some contractors in town may consider this to be good because it imposes barriers to entry and therefore barriers to competition from them, as, as evidenced by uh, their support of high penalties. But they're not thinking ahead. Uh, these people are really are, are not considering the fact that this is just the camel's nose in the tent and there's going to be creeping micromanagement of everything they do to the point where it is going to burden them a lot. It will raise the cost not only to the builders but also to the city. It, you'll notice that the staff didn't mention the incre any increases in costs to the city in the cover sheet that they gave you. Uh, they only mentioned the revenue and, and that's they really weren't re presenting the whole picture to you. Uh, it would raise the cost of housing in Laramie, which is not what we need in the, in the age of COVID-19. Uh, it also uh, contradicts a council goal, which is to make affordable housing available in Laramie. And worst of all, it does not allow you to serve as your own general contractor without a license. If you read uh, Section B, it says general contractor means any person or business entity that contracts, warrants, or represents to be in charge of, lead, or manage any construction project. This does not exempt the homeowner who wants to be their own general contractor. And if you, if you, if you do pass this, I certainly hope you rectify this because right now it does prohibit the homeowner from doing that. Um, in any case, uh, again, what we should be concerned about here is what will come next. Our current bureaucracy seems to think that uh, you'll rubber stamp this and that then they'll be able to sneak in more requirements. And uh, I think ultimately this will be burdensome and just an expansion of bureaucracy in Laramie. So uh, I really think that you should say no to this. Mr. Glass, uh, your three uh, minutes are up. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Anyone else in the public? Comments, questions, concerns? Mr. Mayor? Yes. Casey Frome here. Uh, I agree with a lot of the previous statements. One thing I'd like to point out uh, as well is it seems like this ordinance is to focus on making sure that we don't have bad contractors within the city. Um, the enforcement is something I'm very concerned about. Uh, the, the city seems to think that they can enforce it by um, essentially inspecting, right? Those that pull permits get inspected. I, I know this, I, I build within the city. Um, what I'm concerned about is those that don't want to get the contractor license are no longer going to pull permits and we're going the other way. Um, where those that may have pulled permits previously aren't going to do it now because they have to get a license and we're creating an issue, um, uh, essentially a, a bigger black market, if you will, with those that don't want to get that license. Um, the costs, uh, the costs associated with this were projected to be $500. Uh, if, if we're really concerned about people operating as contractors within the city of Laramie and wanting to regulate that, we need to have people boots on the ground looking for that. Um, if that's not what we want to do, I don't think this bill is, is going to enforce exactly what, we're, what you're wanting to do or whoever's um, proposing this bill. And so I think that's something the council really needs to think about. Um, if we're really going after bad contractors, so to speak, we need to have somebody going out there to go after those bad contractors. Uh, what this bill potentially can do is push those bad contractors even further out of the light and we have more problems simply because of the licensing. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fromm. Any others from the public? Mr. Hine, go ahead. Hello, I was, I was going to say very similar to uh, Casey and uh, Mr. Glass. Uh, just it seems like uh, seems like a lot of the the smaller remodeling places were not put in this. Um, I just I would be curious to know how many of those people participated um, in it. And then um, my second. Uh, 
Yeah, it, I, I just uh, go with the same comment that was just made with Casey and, and Glass. I don't want to take up anybody else's time. Thank you, Mr. Hine. Anyone else? All right. Thank you for the, uh, you know, the, the comments from the public. We appreciate the input. I'm going to go back to the council for any other questions that you may have regarding this before we vote. So let's start with Councillor Weaver, and then we'll go to Vice Mayor Gabriel. And then Brian. And then who? Me. Okay. And Schuster. Okay. okay. Go ahead, Councillor Weaver. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to provide as part of my time an opportunity for the staff to clarify any of the points that they might want to with regard to previous comment and then reserve just a moment for my own comments, Mr. Mayor. All right. Clarice, did you have any comments on the public input that's come in um, tonight? Yes. Um, I needed to clarify that the, it is customary for the insurance to list the city of Laramie as the certificate holder. This is something that has historically been required, licensing the trade contractors as plumbing, electrical, uh, mechanical. And on the state of Wyoming, the city of Laramie is listed as the recipient. And that is actually from the state level. And we cannot accept, they have two different certificates. The one that indicate, that does not indicate the city of Laramie as a recipient, we cannot accept through our office. So I did want to make that clarification. And um, the other clarification that I wanted to make is, yes, an individual can be the listed contractor and hold the contractor license as well as a qualified supervisor license. Um, so an individual can do that if they meet the, re the requirements that is set forth that um, is being proposed. Um, and I think that is all the clarification that I was needed to make. Okay. Uh, Councillor Weaver, do you want to follow up? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, just quickly, uh, I wanted to say that I really appreciate the input we've received from the folks that are in the business that have shared their insights with us on this topic. Uh, and I, I want to thank the staff for their effort on this to bring people that are in the businesses, in the trades, into this process, give them, an, uh, it sounds like, a, a, a meaningful opportunity to have input here. Um, I, I'm going to say a couple of things, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to vote for this, and I think we heard clearly that um, a lot of the small contractors were uh, provided uh, opportunities to share their views on this topic. And then my thought is that most people are not willing to cut corners if it has an impact on the safety of themselves or their families. And then I think 95% of the time that's true even beyond an individual's personal safety or that of their family. Unfortunately, sometimes people are willing to cut corners if it protects their bottom line, and I think this might be a step in the right direction that addresses a number of concerns that I have uh, had for a number of years about some activities in Laramie. So I, I really appreciate that we are, are bringing this forward and the meaningful input from the people that are in the business, and I will be supporting this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Gabriel. Thank you, Mayor. Clarice, just a clarification, I think, on some of the points that have been brought up, and Mr. Stratton brought this up as well. I have an elderly neighbor that I help on occasion. She had some wind damage recently. I'm kind of wondering about the fine line on, you know, I went over and helped do some repair damage. Can you describe from this proposed ordinance on when a person needs to have some kind of license to do repair work? Well, if it is minor repair work, I, I guess 
I find it, um, I find that using discretion and common sense very important in the position of code administration. I know somebody was concerned about enforcement. Um, the city council granted code administration the authority to enforce because of contractors not pulling permits or doing work without permits. We have yet to write one citation. We go and we visit with that contractor or the individual and explain the situation. And more often than not, if a homeowner does something they may not think needs a building permit and then all of a sudden they need us to send in a connect permit for their gas line, we don't penalize them. We get them back to square one, we get the appropriate permits, then we move forward. We're not here, in my opinion, we're here to help the community understand what they need to do to get to a right product, to get, get, the thing, um, get their situation to where it is on track and move forward. We have done this numerous times <coughs> And more often than not, after working with the individual, I have actually waived the double fees to the permit because the people truly did not understand the process. So no, it, it, it isn't my intent to go running around or code administration's intent to go running around with our building inspectors to penalize people. Right now, our code administration has two inspectors. We have 61 new housing projects and 21 major commercial projects and or new. But our intent is to bring in line good general contracting practices with a general contracting process of licensing general contractors. As one general, um, an individual indicated that um, this might drive and penalize to where general contractors go are going deeper. Again, if you look at it, we're giving them a grace period to start the process of being, getting their general contractor license to move forward. We're not running out there the first day putting a stop work, or work order number and writing our $750 citation. Our intent, I, I have worked with trade contractors that come in from Colorado, that come from out of town, plumbing, mechanical, and electrical, and work with them to get them permitted so that they can work on the McDonald's project, so they can work on the Big D Sinclair project. They have enough hurdles. I do try to eliminate this, and I understand that there's several that are think that this is a hurdle for general contractors. The question that I get asked, and I do have a hard time answering besides saying, well, the city of Laramie do not license general contractor, is the question, well, why do you license electrical plumbing and electrical refrigeration, lawn sprinkler, water and sewer? when you don't license the general contractor that is in charge of the whole project? That's the tough question that is a little bit hard to answer because the general contractor does run the project. They do orchestrate the subs. They've got to know, not, they've got to know it from the ground up. And the other clarification that I want to make clear is not because uh, someone indicated that every foreman and project manager have to be licensed. That is not what it's saying. That for a general contractor, they need to have one qualified supervisor that passed at the level that the general contractor is licensing for. And the trade contractors we separated out, those are defined as the ones that we are licensing at currently and prior. The plumbing, the mechanical, the electrical. We are not licensing or proposing to license 
the subcontractors that work underneath the building contractor license, such as the drywallers, the masonry, the concrete, the painters, etc. So those we are not licensing at this time. It's not proposed that they're being licensed at this time. But we are proposing to bring in the general contractors in line with the other contractors, like the trade contractors. I mean, they're the foundation of new construction, of major remodeling and remodeling. And I don't know if I answered your question, but it is not our intent to Most, yeah, thank you. Mo, sorry, I went off on a tangent. Most minor maintenance does not require a permit. If you start doing structural stuff, demolishing a wall, tearing down a wall, I mean, even if you, were, if you were replacing a small drywall piece because the kid threw a baseball through the wall, you're not going to have to get a permit for that. Mm -hmm. If you're redoing a room, knocking down walls, demolishing, then yes. But for minor repairs, helping out your neighbor, to me, that's what community does without saying. Very thorough. I appreciate that. Thank you. Councilor Schuster. Thank you. Um, I'm also the Planning Commission liaison. We've had three incidents in the last year where people did not pull permits and I'm going to use the word got busted. So they had to then apply in front of the planning commission for a variance because not only did they not pull a permit, they did not even follow guidelines in the least bit. So I just wonder how many of those are we catching? How many of those are we not catching? And I think there needs to be just a little bit of rewriting. I want to talk to some people. I've talked to some people from Cheyenne have even contacted me because they were doing Cheyenne and got frustrated with Cheyenne's building code and then came over here and they also said that when they got frustrated with Cheyenne on some of the stuff that they went out and went together as a group and bought some property out at Cheyenne and built on your I call them farmettes the little where they get so many acres and then can sink a, a, a well and a septic and Cheyenne got landlocked China has a problem right now. They, they're having trouble expanding. We're going to have trouble expanding on a couple of our sides already here because you've got people going out there and doing that. We need, we need to work with some people to try to get things going correctly. So it's, it's, it's not perfect yet. I, I, I know it can't be perfect, but I don't think it's got to get better. Because I see, I see the problems a lot of times because of people having to now come to the Planning Commission, ask for a variance on what they have built. And uh, how many of those are being caught? How many of those are we even stopping? So, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pierce, did your hand? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I just have a, a couple points I'd like to make. Um, first of all, uh, we received an email from Frankie Spiegelberg, so even though you called their name twice, uh, we do have an email. I just wanted to remind folks of that. And the other thing is somewhat in line with uh, what Councillor Schuster mentioned in terms of, of a little bit of a review on the wording. Um, when we meet next time, I, I would like to see uh, staff's comments related to what um, Tom Matamor uh, suggested and, and left a, a copy of, of what his thoughts were on that. I don't believe they were addressed yet at this time, so I, I'd appreciate some sort of um, addressing of of his comments and, and overall like like most of us it, this sounds uh, pretty positive and I really appreciate um, staff bringing bringing the professionals um, to the table and, and having these discussions uh, it's very much appreciated so thank you very much thank you Councillor Pierce Councillor Stalzer thank you Mayor I agree with a lot of the comments tonight. I see the value in this, but I think there are a couple things that maybe just need to be reworded and maybe need to work on some amendments or, you know, specifically explicitly saying that a homeowner can work on their 
um, their own property. Um, so I'm going to vote no on the first reading um, and then maybe have a chance to talk to some more people and propose some amendments. In general, it sounds like a positive thing. I just think it needs a little bit of work. Okay, thank you. Anyone else on the council? Clarice, I have a couple of questions that I'd like to ask you. I'm going to give you one example. Let's suppose somebody has an older home with no, no garage. And finally they decide they've got room, they're going to add on a single car garage. And they're going to go out and find uh, a framer, someone to do a driveway, someone to do the roof, someone to do, you know, just whatever, you know, garage door, hanger, all that. C can they move forward with that project using what the people that they have asked to come in to do subcontracting work without having to have a general contractor's license. Now I know they have to have a permit, but do they have to have a general contractor's license to build a garage onto their existing structure? They are the owner and the primary Correct. residence of this structure? Correct. Then yes, they would be able to act as their contractor because they are the owner and the primary uh, um, it is their primary residence. Now that being said, they would not only have to submit a building permit application, but they would have to submit a set of drawings as well as a site plan to make sure that they were meeting the setbacks and they were able to do so right. within the zoning and the planning division to avoid having to, if they move forward without that, then that's when they get caught in regards to variances. All right. Well. The question was, can they move forward with all of the requirements of the city without being a general contractor? If it is the, if they are the, it, and the it does state owner. this, as, as it states this in Chapter 15 under the Building Code, that if you are the owner and it is your primary residence, you may work on your house. Okay. So it already states that in the Municipal Code Chapter 15. Okay. Now another question. You open up your Sunday paper. And there's advertisement in there for Anderson, whatever, Gill window. They're going to come in, they're going to put in a new door and a new window. Do they have to have, do these people have to come in and have a contractor's license to do, general contractor's license to do that kind of work? So are the they city? coming in and replacing the same? They're just replacing, taking right. out the window and replacing right. the window. They do not need a permit okay. at this time. So they would not need a permit or a general contractor's license to do that. Okay. If you were re replacing the same and okay. you're not doing anything structural, you're not making the hole smaller, you're not increasing the window size or the door size, then no, at, you don't even need a permit at this point in time. All right. But if they're coming in to do like a, a patio and a, a sunroom on the back of your house, then do they have to be general contractors to do that? They would have to then, yes, be licensed with the City of Laramie to do work in the City of Laramie because they're, they're doing something structural. They're As adding... general contractors. Mm hmm Okay. Now, the University of Wyoming, as they begin their half a billion dollar projects, do they have to have licensed general contractors working on their project? They would if this ordinance goes through, and they would have to be a Class A contractor okay. because of the type of work that they're doing. And um, the big companies like GE Johnson, Richardson, Samson, they're already licensed. I mean, they work all over the state. If they're working all over the state, they're already holding the general so contractor recognize. licensing. And in looking at other jurisdictions, that the International Code Council um, test for the different classes, um, contractor classes, or what we're calling that, because the entity can't take the test. An individual is going to have to take the test. So that's the qualified supervisor of record. Okay. Other municipalities and jurisdictions require the same thing that is listed here in this ordinance through the International Code Council. And it is correct, it is International Code Council. So once you take this test, if you want to be licensed then in Fort Collins, you're going to have to adhere to what that jurisdiction's 
contracting licensing requirements are, but that test is going to go with you. You're not going to have to retake the test as long as you keep up your CEU, your okay. credits. There is one more, just a small one. If a person goes to Rock River and gets a general contracting license, and then they decide to do work in Laramie, Wyoming, they are a general contractor in Laramie, Wyoming? If they're licensed in Rock River, um, I don't know what their requirements are, but they would have to complete a general contractor's license here with a qualified supervisor and have that test. Um, if you are working in Cheyenne, knowing that they require that test, um, then that license, just like with the trade contractors, that City of Cheyenne license, would be in lieu of the International Code Council test because they require it there. So, so you're saying general contractors from other communities throughout the state and maybe other states, as long as they have ICC certification, they're deemed general contractors without taking our tests? They're, we don't issue the test. The test is issued through the International Code Council. Okay. And that's you good would for go us. out to iccsafe.org. Okay. And there you would sign up for your test. There's two ways that the contractor or the qualified supervisor could take that test. And that would either be online, proctored through Pronto, or you can take it through Pearson View, uh, which you can take at Night Hall here in Laramie, um, which is a proctored test and the computers are set up there. So to be licensed in Laramie, the entity, the business, whether it's a sole proprietorship or a corporation, would need to complete the contractor's application. The qualified supervisor or record would acknowledge the, thing, um, the individual items that we talked about earlier, their contact information. The qualified supervisor would complete a certificate of qualification and verification of experience and provide us with a copy of the past ICC test that they're licensing for. You're given a copy of the test that says pass on it. And those are the, those are the things that, we're, that would be required. It mirrors what is required by the trade contractors now, electrical, plumbing, mechanical, one sprinkler. Oh, and then they pay the fees before they get sure. their piece of paper. Okay, thank you, Clarice. Okay, Council, one more chance to ask questions, make comments. This is your chance to make comments before we vote. Council, yes, Councilor McKinney. So back to what he had, thank you, Mayor. Yes. What the Mayor was saying, you own 30 properties. Do you go into one property and somebody destroyed the property and you go in there to fix it because you own the property, not your primary residence? You go in to fix a drywall or a window or a door, or potentially a pipe. Do you have to have a contractor's license? Mm -hmm. Is oh. <clears throat> that would be the same answer that someone that um, if you're under plumbing, mechanical, or electrical, if it's not your primary residence, then, and it, it depends on the scope of your work. You're giving me a hypothetical, and I get calls like this all the time of, well, it's, we're just doing minor work. Well, how minor is it? Well, we're just tearing out a wall. So, I mean, we would have to know exactly what the scope of the work is. If it's minor repair, then no, you don't need to be a general contractor. But if you get, but if you start, if it is structural repair, then you're going to need to have your general contractor license. And I know um, the reason this is important is because I get a lot of calls from people coming in that have bought houses here for their kids to go to school here. And 10, 15 years ago, I was a contractor and, but it's not my primary residence. Well, the problem is, is it's not your primary residence. Your child may be living there, but you also have 
other individuals living there that are not family members. And so um, it's, it, it kind of goes across the board the same. That would apply to plumbing, electrical, and me mechanical. If it's not your primary residence and you're not doing it with your own two hands, you know, then you need to hire a licensed contractor. And that's the way it's been for the trades. Just kind of continue. Councilor McKinney, go ahead. Okay, so hypothetical. Somebody calls you, their kid's playing ball, they knocked out an outlet or a ceiling fan, you have to replace it. Do you have to have a contractor's license to do that in your rental? Because now it becomes... I'm, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, if you're putting in a fan... That's already there. That's already there. No, you wouldn't need to have a contractor's license for that. If you're doing rewiring and rewiring the outlets. Well, how about fixing an outlet? Just say they broke it and you want you to mean replace replacing it. the plate, Just the plate or even the outlet itself. I get technically you would need to have it if it's not your primary residence and you're not the owner of it if you're renting it but it's a minor repair and I would say most people probably would do it and not pull a permit and not need to and they're not obviously not going to call an inspection but if somebody knows that they did the repair because they happen to be in the store oh, oh it's my rental and somebody broke the outlet I'm fixing it they come to you you say something you're gonna write them fine So if I'm understanding you correctly, you have a rental and you broke something. So I guess my question is, would you, you own it? You own it, but not your primary residence. You're renting it, but you it's own a, it. It's a rental property that if I own a property and I mm -hmm. rent it out and somebody broke something and I go to the store and I pick something up and I happen to talk to somebody and say that I'm doing it. You guys show up, say, oh, so-and-so said, or we heard, or you have to have an electrical license to be able to replace that outlet. We need to take a look at it. Okay, so let's go back to square one. As I stated early when I was speaking to Council Gabrielman, we try to utilize discretion in what is going on. And... On something like that, um, when we get calls, I get calls off and on from contractors in the trade that are licensed, letting me know if something they think is going on without a permit. And we use our discretion in regards to that. What I'm seeing right now is you want a I got you situation, and that's okay. But what I'm saying is we're, we're going to use discretion. And as I said earlier, in the year or two that we have had the ability to write a violation of individual contractors coming within the city of Laramie, we have not issued one. So I really can't see that we would be sitting around looking for that one person that went and replaced an electric um, receptacle and looking for that. You as the owner of the property, I'm sure have got liability insurance that if you rewired it poorly, you're going to pay dearly for it. So, I mean, we use our discretion. Most, we don't go out and do inspections unless we have a permit pulled. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. This is, again, the first reading. We're going to have two more opportunities to go through this, should this pass the first reading. But I think we've, I think we've covered the subject. Let's go ahead and have a roll call. And then I think we probably better take a break. And, Way too long, but that's up to the council. Anyway, could we have a roll call? Yeah. Weaver. 
Yes. Harrington? Yes. Pierce? Yes. McKinney? No. Schuster? No. O'Doherty? Yes. Stalder? No. Gabriel? Yes. And Shumway? Yes. Okay, that is six yeses, three noes, zero absent. All right, so that passes the first reading. Council, do you want to take a five minute break? Yes. Yes, we do. <laughs> okay, we will be back at five minutes after nine, so go I'll ahead and take a five minute break. Go first, hold on, can we go? There, so we're going to get back to our, our agenda for the regular city council meeting. The next item is item number 12. Uh, it's to be introduced to us by Councillor Doherty. I move to approve on first reading original ordinance 2009 amending chapter 10.08 of the Laramie Municipal Code related to the official traffic commission. Second. So second. I moved and seconded by Councillor Schuster. Um, who do we have that's going to introduce the uh, original ordinance on the uh, changes to the traffic commission? This is Bob Southerd, Your Honor. I'll uh, speak first. All right, go ahead. And, and uh, somebody, uh, Brooks Webb, is also on the line for okay. more detailed operational questions if you have them. Um, you all have seen this before. I mean, this is the, this is the end of a one-year-plus-long process. You've seen this proposed ordinance, um, and so I'll, but I'll walk through it again one more time. You know the reason for revising the ordinance is that the old traffic commission ordinance looked to be easily a hundred years old um, and it just needed updating. Uh, this particular, so this this draft ordinance, I'll just go through it. So we have, we still have the traffic safety commission. Uh, we've changed the membership. It's still um, primarily a citizen board, six citizens, and three city staff. Um, those citizens, uh, we, we, we kept it at six uh, because we've now got six members of uh, the commission active. Their um, terms are already staggered, so it'll be easy to pick up uh, with this new commission. Um, next, uh, the commission is going to operate by bylaws, which you've also already had, you've already seen, you had a work session on, and received public comment on, uh, including comment from um, uh, members of the traffic commission. Um, that, that's where some of the operational details of the traffic commission will become more apparent about how, you know, folks bring issues before the traffic commission, etc. That'll, that'll be done by resolution. So if this goes through to a third reading, we would anticipate bringing the resolution uh, and a discussion of the bylaws in front of you at that time. Um, the next section is just a very general uh, description of the wide ranging uh, uh, brief of the uh, traffic commission uh, to work with uh, staff and make uh, recommendations to staff and in certain circumstances to council. Uh, and last, the um, ordinance makes clear what the city engineer should be doing um, as far as doing his or her job uh, according to national standards. So this is, to be, I mean, to be absolutely blunt, um, I think the operation of the of the traffic uh, commission uh, will be more defined in those bylaws, but this so this is the general superstructure uh, for a more modern traffic commission. Now, if you have questions about uh, uh, you know operational on the ground operations, I think Brooks Webb can speak to that. Uh, but if you have questions about the structure of this ordinance, I can answer those. All right, let's hear from Brooks Webb first, and then we'll go to questions for either our city attorney or for Brooks Webb. 
Brooks, did, would you like to make comments before we start asking questions? Honorable Mayor, City Council, I don't really have a whole lot to add at this point. Um, like Bob said, I mean, the ordinance is pretty straightforward. The the, the bylaws um, that, that we've drafted and that you've seen will basically bring back to you uh, through resolution um, after a third reading of the ordinance. Um, so you'll have another good look at those then. Um, but if you have, uh, if you've got, you know, if you've got uh, other questions uh, that I can answer, I'm, I'm happy to do so. Okay, thank you. All right, let's start with questions. Councilor Doherty. Um, I, I think this, the last paragraph is really out of place. I don't think there's any other board or commission that defines the duty of a city employee within a commission. So I, I would move to strike 10 point uh, 08.040 from this resolution. Second. Okay, there's a motion to have an amendment to strike 10.08. Do you have that, uh, Ryan? The uh, could you read the number again it's for It's 10.08.040, duties, city engineer. I just think it's out of place in a... Okay. We're talking about a commission. All right. Uh, okay, now we're only talking about the amendment. Um, city attorney or Brooks Webb, do you want to make comments on the... Uh, um, motion this amendment to remove the duties of the city engineer from this uh, ordinance? Well, I'm, I'm going to let uh, Brooks speak in more detail if he wishes. I, just, I think it was there um, so that there's clarity for the traffic commission about what the city engineer is supposed to be doing. Okay. Um, but but uh, Brooks, you can certainly chime in. Mr. Webb, go ahead. Yeah, Honorable Mayor Council, I, I agree with Bob, and I think, you know, the, w the way this is being set up in ordinance is that, you know, the commission is, is advising and making res res uh, recommendations to the city engineer. So, um, you know, when we were putting it together, um, we just wanted to outline uh, the city engineer's duties as it, as it has to do with traffic commission. City Manager. Um, Mayor and Council, I think it's important for the Council to be aware as well that the duties of a city engineer are statutorily, uh, well, the position of a city engineer is defined in statute, and Bob may have it more readily in front of him. I could look it up for you, but I think that is in part, Councilor Doherty, what drove this is some of the issues are that the engineer has statutory duties, and that was unclear, it seems, in the past to the commission members what those duties were and so you know the saying good fences make good neighbors i guess something to that degree to make sure that everybody understood you know what 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 their role was i guess is what i'm trying to say and bob i don't know if you have that statute handy i can look it up all right you can too of course but i don't have it Andy. okay um let's have the council now uh, discuss the uh, amendment and uh, I think we've already heard a little bit from Councilor Doherty. Did you want to make more comments before we... No, that's okay. Nice. Anyone else on the amendment? Councilor McKinney? Well, I'm, I, we're talking about removing the how, how we're going to put the Traffic Commission back into their role and then we have the city engineer on there of what but he's is he going to be on the staff or on the commission is that on the bylaws i believe he is a part uh, yes of uh, oh, i'm sorry your honor yeah go ahead, go ahead mr souther the the th there are six um appointees by council civilian appointees and the other three will be City manager or designee, chief of police or designee, and city engineer or designee. Okay. That clarify that. Okay. So, what are their roles? If you're, if you're, uh, so. Well, 
where's their roles in it? If the city engineer's in here, isn't their role, should, shouldn't their role be in here? You're talking about the city manager and the, the city, city manager, chief yeah, police? the chief of police. So we know what their full yeah. role is with that's, the commission? Sure, that's a good question. We have the duties of the engineer, but is it necessary? I mean, we're talking about <clears throat> removing the one. That makes sense to me, but uh, Mr. Southard or Brooks Webb or city manager, you want to comment on that question? Our uh, Mayor City Council, the the other members, their purpose and responsibility, basically, well, all their purpose and responsibility as commission members falls under 10.08.030 purpose and responsibility. Um, the city engineer's duties are are a little further than that, um, which is why they're further defined. Okay. Anyone else want to make comments on that? City manager? I, I just would add to that. Um, part of the reason for that is the city engineer is a licensed um, engineer and has licensure responsibilities and duties um, whereas these other members of the committee are just general folks and not encumbered other than there is one civilian uh, and councillor mckinney this is outlined in section 10.08.010 there's really just three main sections um, so so the recognition is that the city engineer is a statutory position and that as a person holding professional licensure, there are certain obligations that the city engineer has that are unique and special to that licensure and statute that, for instance, I or my designee, who would probably be Brooks Webb, the public works director, would not have. Councilor Doherty. Um, I, I think since it's an advisory council, it doesn't make policy that it's not necessary to have city staff and not necessary to describe what a city employee does in that much detail when we're talking about an advisory committee. And, and the information or the advice they give can be taken or not if the city engineer um, Things it's not appropriate. So I, I just think it's out of place there. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Councillor Stalder. Um, I'm looking for, but I can't find the Board of Health. That would be another example where you have a licensed individual, like you have a physician, but I don't know if it outlines their duties, just for comparison. Um, and I can't find it online. Yeah, Mayor and Council Member Stolder, I, I don't believe it does, but they're not members of city professional staff. They're outside folks. So uh, Board of Health requires, I think, a dentist and a, doctor. And a medical doctor. Um, but it does not, the statute, or excuse me, our municipal code does not outline that because they're outside separate professionals like for instance councillor stalder you're an rn um, but because the city engineer is a in statutory in position of the city yeah okay. councillor pierce yes thank you mayor um can you tell me who the second was on councillor odorty's motion i missed that maybe i did too that was stalder. no that's stalder. Stalder. okay good we're Thank you. Proper. Thank you, Chancellor Pierce. Further discussion? Uh, do I see hands? Wave them. Right here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't like the way you do. I don't like. I need to. I need to start. I'm going to start, start watching the, over here. I know. I'm going to get a screen drop down in the middle so you can see. <laughs> Go ahead, Chancellor Stoller. You're up. Yeah, I just really want to reiterate what Councilor Doherty said. I think that it's the, the job of the staff, professional or not, to make recommendations to an advisory board. So that's where all that professional qualifications and licensure comes in. And they say, I reviewed all the books with all the long acronyms, and this is what we're supposed to do. And then it's the advisory board's job to say, does this fit Laramie? You know, the fourth and Clark parking debacle that started all of this was like a really good example of that. And then it comes to council. So there's a there's two more layers of approval beyond that. I just don't, I don't know. I don't think it needs to be outlined quite that way. I agree with Councilor Rodorty. That's all. <laughs> Vice Mayor Gabriel. Thank you, Mayor. And I would just uh, disagree on that point because I feel 
that the commission needs professional advice trying to decipher the best possible way to uh, proceed with traffic recommendations that if they have that professional advice there then we don't need to have that uh, later down the road if we start initially with the traffic commission it just seems to me that uh, a lot of times when you have that professional advice there then uh, it's for the best uh, uh, overall the commission will make hopefully better decisions Stalder, yeah, I very much agree that they need the input. I just am saying, like, the way it's worded specifically, I don't think we need that specific designation. Okay, still on the amendment. Okay. Uh, Councillor Doherty? I'm not saying remove the engineer. I'm saying mm -hmm. remove where we describe what the city engineer does. We don't, you know, and if nope. you change, if the guidelines change, from Ashto to um, Ashtum, then you would have to change the ordinance. It just seems like it's too specific. That it's not saying remove the engineer. I'm just saying we don't need to describe the job of the city engineer when we're talking about a board, a commission. Thank you. Okay. All right. Honorable Mayor, if I may say something just for a second. This is Eric Japp, city engineer. Yes, city engineer, go ahead. Yeah, so with this, the, the thing I wanted to add on this section was as the traffic commission has um, moved forward, one of the things that was noted as we were setting up the, the ordinance uh, is that there was nothing stating what the traffic commission shall be held to. So as you look at this, that's what the, the MUTCD is, the, the ASHTO, the NACTO. And, and that's what the one of the main points of having this section in the ordinance was, was to outline that as the traffic commission moves forward with, um, you know, plans, ideas, you know, designs, that they are held to these standards. Uh, that is something that was lacking in the previous ordinance and was noted that that was needed to be added to this and then with that the, the city engineer is being added in there because it becomes the city engineer's responsibility for that to you know in, enforce that and that's you know it's it's outlining what those code requirements are and then the city engineer is responsible for that so i, I understand where council's coming from but i also wanted to to add that explanation that it's more of establishing what rules and guidelines and, and all that the traffic commission is held to than necessarily defining the role as the city engineer. The city engineer is just responsible for making sure those rules are upheld for the traffic commission. Thank you, Councilor Doherty. The previous ordinance gave the traffic commission technically the ability to go down and make a left turn lane. So that was the problem with the old ordinance. Um, if we're making it just an advisory council to begin with, then then this is superfluous. Thank you. Any questions, comments, or concerns from the public? I'm trying to get my camera to work. Okay, Nancy, you're on our list, so thank you. Go ahead. You have three minutes. Um, okay, I did a whole lot of preparation. I don't know if I can cover it all in three minutes, plus what everybody else has said. Uh, my main objection is that we have three voting members that are also city staff. When an item comes before the traffic commission, whether it was brought by the public or by the, by the city, the first thing that happens is it's prepared by the engineering department. They would give us a packet, similar to council packet, with wonderful diagrams and numbers and figures and anything we would need to make the decision. That's their vote. They've already voted on that. We would consider what they had. We would also consider public input. 
uh, what we saw on the ground, our own experiences and knowledge, and become a sounding board for the public. So that if the engineer following their duties um, specifically says, you need, to re you need to put a left turn lane here, using that example, and the board says, no, we don't think so, the engineer has fulfilled their duty to follow their guidelines. They will not lose their license if the city does not decide to do what they recommend. Um, I also wanted to look at, um, and, and that's the way the process has worked in the past. Um, my main contention is having the um, non or the voting members uh, there that are already paid staff that have already created the the input that the commission will look at. Um, there needs to be as much public input since commerce and transportation is such a large part of how we run the city and it needs to be democratic they need to be able to come to the sounding board and not have the city overrule I also very much would like to have professional engineers on the board if we don't have them can the board not meet this is required I in one of the paragraphs I didn't write the numbers down um, that at least one member of the Commission must be a licensed engineer well if we don't if none apply what do we do does that shut the whole thing down? Um, in the past, we've had we've had we had the wonderful joy of having a university professor, and we were able to use the work of the students as, and, and they gained and the city gained, you know, saved thousands of dollars on one one thing that if I remember correctly. Um, okay, I'm trying to read quick, and. Previously, if there was something that was of concern on our agenda to the police chief or the state highway department or any number of other agencies, they would send a liaison to show up and, and give us input. So re giving them voting privileges I don't think is proper. Um, also, the enabling ordinance and the bylaws, I think we should be looking at them together, putting in the bylaws by uh, a single one-time shot at the end of this process is not allowing for enough public input on how everything should be done. Uh, I'm going to save my last however much time I have in case I need to comment again. Thank you. Thank you, sir, Mr. Mayor. All right. Thank you, Nancy. Anyone else in the public that would like to make comments? Uh, Mr. Glass, go ahead. Uh -huh. Honorable Mayor Shumway, members of council, uh, yes, this jumped out at me right away, and it seems to me that it's completely and totally wrong, as uh, Ms. Sindelar said. It is completely inappropriate to have city bureaucrats as ex officio members of a board of a commission. Uh, several of the members in this proposal would not be council appointees, but rather employees hired by the city manager. Um, what's more, some of them are one another's bosses, and therefore they wouldn't be independent members of the commission. Uh, city boards and commissions are and should be bodies of ordinary citizens appointed by you, the city council, and the ordinances require them to have terms uh, so that they can be considered uh, for, by you as, as members and uh, you can determine whether they do a good job or not. This obviously is not consistent with a city employee hired by the city manager staying on as long as he or she has a job. The PE requirement, as Nancy mentioned, is also inappropriate because we have one on staff to advise the commission already. Uh, Again, as I said earlier in, in this meeting, we need democracy, not bureaucracy. If we have a commission at all, it should consist of members of the public appointed by you, our elected officials. City bureaucrats already have plenty of power. They shouldn't be members of any board or commission. Uh, they can advise it, but they absolutely should not be voting members. Uh, unless this is fixed, please vote this item down. Thank you, Mr. Glass. Any el anyone else in the public? Sarah had raised her hand. Uh, Sarah Gorin, you're muted. If you want to unmute, you're welcome to speak. Okay, is that, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes, Sarah, go ahead. No, we can't. Okay, 
I'm Sarah Gordon. I'm at 508 South 11th, and I just, um, yep, I'm Sarah Gordon at 508 South 11th, and I just wanted to support Nancy Sindelar's point that there shouldn't be city staff on the traffic commission. It's an advisory uh, commission, it's a citizen commission, and they're not there to enforce standards or be held to standards. They're there to serve as a conduit for public concerns. Um, to compare it to the Planning Commission, with which I'm more familiar, um, you know, the Planning Commission even sits as a quasi-judicial body when it sits as the Board of Adjustment, and there's they are advised by city staff, but there's no city staff on it. Um, so I think it would make more sense to keep it as a citizen advisory body and uh, um, allow the interaction of bringing uh, citizen concerns through the traffic commission to the city, but not to have city staff on the commission itself. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else in the public? Seeing none, go back to council. This is again on the <coughs> amendment only. We're not, uh, let's, any other comments before we vote on the amendment? Let's go to the city manager and then we'll come back to council. Mayor, um, I just wanted to mention, I certainly appreciate the discussion, but I will tell you, staff did research, tried to model our transportation, uh, or traffic commission, excuse me, uh, after something more current than what we had previously in code, which referred to dray stands. I don't even know what that is. Um, in any case, I will tell you it is not unusual, and we could certainly provide some examples on second reading at all for a transportation planning committee to involve professional staff. Um, case in point, I would offer, I, I'm trying to look it up, but it's just too late and I'm, my brain's too slow. Um, but when you're engaging in trans transportation planning, it is very common to involve professional staff with that long-term view of uh, the trajectories for growth in the community, where transportation will need to be extended, et cetera. So be happy to provide that if it would help people feel more confident going forward. Okay. Thank you. Council? <laughs> even, even face this way. Thank you, Mayor. Councilor Stalder. Um, so I just wonder, in the example that we were kind of talking about earlier, where the city engineer says, no, you should not put a left-hand turn lane, and the traffic commission says, we would like to put a left-hand turn lane, and they get that many votes. So the last sentence of this 10.08040 says, the city engineer shall complete, approve, and certify a final design for all multimodal traffic matters. So by putting that in there, are we setting them up to have to certify something that they don't recommend? I think we need to have an answer for that for this. City attorney, would you uh, want to make comments on whether or not the city engineer <coughs> certifies things that they do not agree with, depending on the vote? Honorable Mayor, City Council, I may want to let Eric speak to this, but um, I think if it does not meet their the, the, the standards, that they're not going to be obligated to to uh, certify that as final design and and put that into action. Um, if there's a dispute, it may go to council where where council looks at it. Um, but you know, as a professional as a professional employee. They've got an obligation to meet certain standards, and if they don't meet those standards, they may not put their stamp on that on that final design, and and wouldn't be obligated to do so anyway through statute. Mr. Webb, is that what happened on the Fourth Street decision? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. All right. Anyone else before we vote? On the amendment, it's the roll call. <clears throat> okay, Pierce. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, Stalder. Yes. Schuster. Yes. Harrington. Yes. Doherty. Yes. 
Weaver? Yes. McKinney? Yes. Gabriel? No. And Shumway? No. That is seven yeses and two noes. So that no longer is a part of the ordinance that we're looking for, look, looking to. So let's go back to the uh, original ordinance which we have, which has been amended. Discussion by the council on the original ordinance now as it stands without the engineer being a uh, description and now, maybe I think maybe we, just so we, we're clear on this is does this remove the city engineer as a voting member of the traffic commission by our action? No, it's still. In. Oh no, it does not. Okay, still a voting. Okay. But the description is no longer a part of the of the ordinance. Okay, let's go. So we're back to the original ordinance now. And what did I do? I looked the wrong way. Who is it? <laughs> Finally, <Okay. laughs> Councillor Pierce. Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Pierce, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Given the time, and we've not addressed the time at this point, I move that we postpone uh, this this discussion and and this ordinance at this time. Is there a second? Second. It's moved and seconded by Councilor Doherty. Um, it's non-debatable, so let's go ahead and vote on the postponement. Okay. Harrington? Yes. Doherty? Yes. Schuster? No. Weaver? No. McKinney? No. Pierce? Yes. Stalder? No. Gabriel? No. And Shumway? No. That is three yeses and six no, Your Honor. <clears throat> okay, so, we're, so we continue on with our discussion. Paul Weaver has his hand up. Councillor Weaver. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On the uh, main motion, I have a couple of questions, Mr. Mayor, through you, uh, one of which was already raised during public input previously. The first time this uh, item was introduced to council, the bylaws were included. And I must say that most of the amendments that I would have proposed pertain to the bylaws. And I think those need to be considered in tandem for us to make, uh, seems like it would be best for us to make decisions with the bylaws included. So I believe that by the time we come to the second reading on this, we need to uh, have been able to look at the bylaws so that we can make uh, the best decision about those. Um, so my question is, can those please be included before uh, the second reading? The second question, Mr. Mayor, is uh, the item in the um, ordinance language that pertains to removal of members by the council. And I can point council to the section if you don't have it in front of you, which is uh, help me out, folks. 10.08.010. Thank you very much, Councillor Stalder. Mr. Mayor, through you. Um, the City Council may remove any council appointed member of the Traffic Safety Commission whenever it decides such removal would be in the best well, whenever it decides such removal would be in the best interest of the city and she'll fill vacancies created by resignation death or removal of any member now vacancies created by resignation or death I, I think uh, that's self-explanatory but I wonder if this ability for the council to remove appointed members of the Commission and whenever it decides such a removal would be in the best interest of the city. Is any of our other boards and commissions? I, and if somebody could answer whether or not that's the case for the Planning Commission, the Civil Service Commission, and um, Parks and Rec, for instance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Those are my, those are my questions. Okay. I think the answer to that is it depends on the bylaws. And uh, I guess if there's anyone that knows the answer to that, I would, I would guess that they're not all subject to removal by the council with that specific designation for that. Anyone Mayor, if I, Mayor, if I may, I certainly yes, have, not, yeah, I've not studied uh, other boards and commissions for that specific reason. I know it's not uncommon. I wouldn't advise 
setting up a board unless you could remove people from it. Okay. It's a, rec it's a recommending body. All right. Now, council, our, our, we will complete, we're past 9.30. We're, we're into the last item on our agenda, so we'll complete this unless we get up to the 10 o'clock hour. I would like to leave some time <clears throat> at your discussion so that we could have public comment. So uh, we have already uh, denied a, a motion to postpone. So let's see if we can get through this quickly. And go. Any other comments from the council? Questions? Public, anything from the public on the ordinance in general? Oh, okay, before we go to the public, I looked over here. You, you wait till I turn my head. That's <laughs> <Not> true. <laughs> Councillor Stoller. Thank you. Um, I know it's very late, but I would like to make an amendment before we vote on this. Okay. Um, I would like to amend section 10.08.010 to read, the Traffic Safety Commission is created and shall consist of six members as follows, and strike the city engineer, the city manager, and the chief of police and their designees. Second. It's been moved and seconded to <clears throat> strike those three individuals as voting members of the Traffic Commission. Not, yeah, Traffic Commission. City Manager. Um, I would just suggest um, you need to be mindful of the number of people on the committee. I think that leaves six by my count, and you need an odd number or you won't have an ability to break ties. Yeah, a 3-3 three, three vote is a defeat. <clears throat> In that case, can I... Amend my amendment before we get into the amending. Depends on the second. Are you friendly to a friendly amendment? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's really late. See, see what he, go ahead and make your... What if that said seven members, but still strike all of the city staff? Are you... Okay, we have a... <clears throat> what? Council okay, McKinney. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so now we're, the, the motion is to <clears throat> change the number of appointed uh, individuals to the traffic commission from six to seven without city staff being voting mm -hmm. members, but they would also be there as advisory. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Discussion on the amendment. City manager. Uh, Mayor and Council, it's certainly the Council's pleasure, but um, I think that I'm going to offer my opinion. Um, I've pulled up on Google in the last five minutes the top three hits on city traffic commissions, and this doesn't include the pile of research on my desk that I didn't bring tonight. Um, Las Vegas, Nevada, Binghamton, New York, and I think it's St. Louis, Missouri. Top three hits that all in their transportation planning committees involve professional trained staff who understand how to operate and manage the rights of way that this city is responsible for. And that's not only managing the physical property of the right of way, but that includes managing the safety of, of thousands of motorists, of every resident of the city, every tourist of the city, every pedestrian of the city, every bicyclist of the city. Um, if we, it's your pleasure, if you want to take it out, and that's fine. But I think that it puts us exactly where we started this conversation nine months ago, where you have engineers coming in front of lay people who are overriding those safety decisions and then bringing to you all um, a tie to break. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just don't know that it gets us any closer toward our goal, which I understood to be modernizing this ordinance so that our transportation planning was done in an effective manner that represented safety of the public, motorists, and all the people I've mentioned, and also introduced that important public uh, sounding board, I think, that Nancy Sindelar mentioned. I also have to tell you, as well as the folks on this call, I don't know how my staff feel, but I find it very affronting as a public employee and public servant to have it insinuated that somehow I don't care about the input of the public. Um, and I expect my staff, the city engineer, the public works director, every member of this staff to welcome and involve and take 
the members, or excuse me, the input and, and uh, recommendations of the public. That is not a sole function of you as elected officials. It is not a sole function of folks who sit on boards and commissions. That is a function that all 275 employees of the city perform every single day, which is to take very seriously the feedback we get from our public. So that's my two cents on it. Um, again, I just don't know that it is going to get us any better place than what we have in our code right now. So thank you. Okay. Discussion by the council on the amendment. We have seven members of advisory from city staff. Weaver's got his hand. Weaver's got hand up. Who, who did? Oh, Councilor Weaver. Councilor Weaver, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and other eagle-eyed members of the council looking for hands <laughs> raised. Um, Mr. Mayor, speaking to the amendment, I, I believe I understand where, where the, the amendment is coming from. And I believe that the council is, has a, a mind to try to strike a balance for the public process that we want to preserve, but also to make sure that that professional input that is necessary and the decisions made by the uh, soon to be formed traffic safety commission is also included and we need to strike that balance i'm not certain that this amendment achieves that with removing all of the professional influence uh, from the voting uh, that will take place on this advisory uh, commission now true it is an advisory commission but on that same token there, there is a place for, for that expertise to be included as these recommendations are then made to the council to approve, amend, or deny. So I, I can't support the amendment as, as it's currently framed because I think it's a bridge too far away from what we're trying to achieve. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Weaver. Other comments? Are there, Councilor Stalder? Thank you for what you said, Janine had no intent with my amendment to discredit city staff. I just think it's important that they make those recommendations based on their expertise. Um, but it would be to me not democratic for them to make a recommendation and then vote on their own recommendation. That's Thank you. Yeah, on the amendment, anything from the public? Glass, yeah. Mr. Glass, go ahead. Um, Mr. Mayor, members and council, on and for the amendment, I just went ahead and looked up the uh, traffic board of the city of Binghamton, New York, which our city manager mentioned. And uh, this board is consisting entirely of city officials, either, uh, e either uh, city staff or city council. That's not a citizen board. Our boards and commissions are citizen boards and should remain so. So I, I really, I, I, I'm, I am very much for the amendment. I think we should have a citizen <coughs> board which is advised by the uh, uh, by city staff, but does not have voting members of city staff. Thank you. For the comments from the public, uh, Nancy Sendelar, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I am for this amendment. I would like to see seven, um, partially because uh, in my past in the military, I learned about span of control. Nine people is just more than our brains can comprehend. Six is the number of people that you normally have uh, in a in a group. So seven would be a compromise, and sometimes we have absences. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Further comment from the public. Get back to the council uh, comments from the council, Councilor Schuster. Thank you. I'm gonna. I'm gonna set the whole room on fire here, but I, I'm gonna make a friendly amendment to the amendment so that we have ten different things to vote on. I would like to reduce the voting members back to six, and then put one staff member on there as a designee of the city manager, who she think would be best for there, so they would have one vote to do that. So the seventh would be back in there, but it would be just one, and they would have one vote. Anyone second the amendment to the amendment? Would 
I'll second that. Okay, the second was from the designation it would be. Councillor Harrington, so we're discussing right, the right. amendment to the amendment to have six appointed members to the commission and one designee that's a voting member from the city. As And Councillor Schuster, you had suggested it come from the city manager? Yes, yeah, she would make okay. the decision on who the All right. designee would okay. be. Okay, discussion on that. Councillor O'Doherty? Just point of order, doesn't the original amendment maker have to accept a friendly amendment? No, okay. not, not the amendment to the amendment, okay. only to change the original amendment. It's so confusing. Further discussion on the amendment to the amendment? Anything from the public on the amendment to the amendment? Council, any comments before we vote on the amendment to the amendment? Well, Councilor Weaver. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I believe this amendment gets closer to the balance that I would like to see uh, this decision achieve. And uh, thinking about span of control and nine people being difficult to uh, keep track of, it occurs to me that the city council has nine members. <laughs> Okay. Case in point. Okay, we're back to the city council now on the amendment to the amendment. Anyone else on the council before we vote? All right, we're going to vote on this uh, and go ahead with roll call. Okay. McKinney? No. Stalder? No. Harrington? Yes. O'Doherty? Yes. Schuster? Yes. Pierce? Yes. Weaver? Yes. Gabriel? Yes. And Shumway? Yes. That is seven yeses, two noes. Okay, now the n numbers have changed where we're no longer six and zero, but we're now six and one, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we go to her. Now, now let, me, let me just clarify. Uh, are we no longer talking about the amendment because it's been changed, or do we, where are we? We have because to go to her amendment because we removed three, but inserted one. So what, what uh, let's, well, I was asking our parliamentarian, do you know or should we ask for clarification from our city attorney? Um, so that was a secondary amendment, and since so she was making the first amendment to take away the three members right. of city staff, and then we changed that to add the one that okay. Councilor Schuster said. And that's a majority vote. Would it be okay. helpful if I took my amendment off the table? Since I assume the vote will be exactly well, the same. Well, the amendment to the amendment is passed, so that's of record. And I just wanted to know are we finished with the amendment? So uh, it seems a little bit confusing. Mayor, if, yes. uh, if we didn't vote on the second amendment, we wouldn't be changing it from what okay. was already in there now. All right, so really, basically, we what we have back. is we have the amendment that's been amended, and so now we're going to vote on the amendment. To change as it. amended. Yes. Okay. So if I'm voting yes, what am I voting for? Okay. If you're six voting yes, one. you're voting okay. for six and right. one. If not, it's it's six it would three. stay the same as All right. Nine. And are we getting close to the, we're done with this discussion. Okay. Okay. Now, council, anything you have in addition to this? Public, anything you want to add to the Amendment as it has been amended. Mr. Glass. Uh, yes, uh, the city staff already has ample input. And again, I think it's inappropriate to have, uh, this is supposed to be a citizen commission. I really think that they, there should not be any, uh, um, anyone who is city staff on a, uh, on a citizen board or commission. So I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll stick with that. Okay, thank you. Back to the council. Now, council, let me just say this. If you defeat 
this amendment will go back to six and three. Mm -hmm. If you pass it, we'll go back, we'll, we will go as amended to six and one. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion on this before we vote? I'll leave Nancy, send your hand up. Nancy, I'm sorry I missed you before we went to the back to the council. Go ahead, Nancy. Uh, I'm sitting here in the dark, so it's easy to miss. I just wanted to say council has nine members. We used to have nine wards, and we couldn't get enough candidates. So we went to three wards, and that's why we have nine councilors. It's a good number. Thank you. All right. Council, quickly, because if we don't vote, we're just going to have to bring this up, start all over on the next city council meeting. Do we have a roll call? This is on the... Second Amendment. Amendment, right. And then we'll have to vote on the main... We will, if we have time. Okay. So let's go. Harrington. Yes. O'Doherty. Yes. Schuster. Yes. McKinney. No. Uh, Pierce. Yes. Stalder. No. Weaver. Yes. Gabriel. Yes. And Shumway. Yes. That is seven yeses, two noes. All right. I'm looking at the clock. I believe we are finished without completing this topic. And so it's going to be on the first item on the agenda for our next city council meeting. Um, now, is there a motion for from anyone on the the uh, what's left on our agenda? Do you want to do the executive session? Yes. Make a motion we do at least 15 minutes of public comment if somebody wants to do it, and then we'll go to executive session. I think it's a lot of people Here. left waited a long time. Yes. We can't, we can't. Okay. Mayor, this is uh, City Clerk Bartholomew. Um, in your C Council Code of Conduct 2.09, um, it says that City Council shall reserve time at the end of each regular meeting for public comment, regardless of the hour. And that, that's what we'll do. So, um, City Manager. Mayor, if I could offer as well, um, one of your executive session topics could be postponed to your next meeting. I don't think it would cause harm. But you would suggest that we still have the executive session? But in, only for one topic. Yeah, I can't speak to the personnel matter, but the litigation matter, we could delay two weeks. Okay. It, it would not be a big deal. City Attorney, is it uh, your opinion that we could if the council decide, decided to not do the uh, executive session, would that be anything that would cause problems with you? Uh, oh my goodness, no. It would not cause a problem. All right, let's do public comment now. We have, uh, we're reserving 15 minutes. Each person that wants to speak will have three minutes, and we'll begin with whoever wants to start. Glass, go ahead. Mr. Mayor? Oh, Mr. Mayor. Okay, again, um, my name is Sarah Gorin. Okay, Mr. Glass, I'll could you wait and we'll have Sarah because... first? Go ahead, Sarah. Sarah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I just want to get, thank you. I just want to get this on the record because there suddenly seems to be a lot of interest in watching every single minute of a city council meeting. I want to uh, state my appreciation for the other commenters who thank you for your time because I think it's really important to recognize that serving on council is a really time-consuming commitment that involves many, many hours outside the actual council meetings. And I know that for many, uh, most members of the council, many of those hours were spent knocking on doors, talking with voters, talking with them on the phone, emailing with them. And all the members of council were elected by our little D democratic process, meaning that they got more votes than any other candidates in their ward. So it's good to keep in mind that while we're all very passionate about the things that we believe in and our concerns, that that passion may not be shared by all the public in equal measure. There were many eloquent comments earlier tonight about free speech, and anyone who has studied constitutional law learns that free speech, like all other rights, has limits. It can be re regulated by time, place, and manner. 
free speech doesn't mean that you can shout fire in a crowded theater. It doesn't mean that you can parade a brass band through a neighborhood at 2 o'clock in the morning. And it doesn't mean that you can monopolize a city council meeting or use it as a forum for campaigning at the expense of the taxpayers of Laramie. So again, I just wanted to get that out there. I certainly appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Gorin. And then next we have Brett Glass. Uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, members of council, uh, um, I'm uh, as as someone who is volunteering potentially to sit with you. Um, I, I I also want to express my appreciation for the amount of time and effort you put into being on council. It, it is tremendous. Um, one thing which I am concerned about, and uh, this is a procedural thing which you may want to look into, is I don't believe that you ever voted on the main motion on this uh, on this last ordinance. You voted on the amendment uh, twice and got back to the main motion, but I don't think that you ever voted on it. Uh, you may want to check your record to see if you have a recorded vote, but I don't think you do. Um, as for uh, um, one item which is on the consent agenda, which I wanted to comment on, and I didn't get to do it at the beginning, so I'd like to do it now. That was the second de hand dealer license for the GameStop store. Um, we have an archaic ordinance on the books which says that every person who buys, sells, exchanges, or deals in personal property which has previously been used, broken, disfigured, dis uh, deteriorated, or altered shall be considered a second-hand dealer. And uh, GameStop apparently applied for this because they sell things like uh, used games and Xboxes and controllers and things like that. Um, now, they are a local business which is competing with eBay and Amazon, which obviously don't require those licenses. There are many other businesses in Laramie, such as uh, the mountaineering stores, for example, that sell used sporting goods that uh, don't, uh, you know, that don't, uh, shouldn't have to apply for those licenses and probably don't have them. Um, what if I, as a Laramie resident, sell something on eBay uh, that's used? Uh, do I require a license for that? If I have a garage sale, if you take a look at that, uh, if you take a look at the language of that ordinance, a garage sale requires you to have a secondhand dealer license. And if you take a look at the ordinance and, and the details of it, it requires you to get ID and a social security number from everybody who, who sells you anything used. It requires you to take notes in pen and ink in a paper book a bound book, and you can imagine not only how archaic this is, but also uh, how valuable that uh, book full of social secu security numbers might be to someone who wanted to commit identity theft. This is archaic. It also might be unconstitutional because it regulates interstate commerce. Uh, and so uh, I'd like to ask uh, that, uh, you know, that council instruct city staff to reconsider whether you should keep this on the books and waive the fee for that GameStop store because they should certainly shouldn't have to pay it if businesses that compete with them have to do it. Um, so uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's my other comment. I've also sent a comment to you regarding the, uh, the general contractor's license that uh, you can read offline. So anyway, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for serving and for staying this late and have a good evening. Thank you, Mr. Glass. Anyone else from the public? You got three hands up. Okay, let's see. Yeah, love where then you got let's let's start with let's start with Love Laramie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. What happened tonight, uh, I found it very troubling and actually adds a uh, few layers to what happened uh, last week, and I think it really requires, it uh, necessitates a formal and a legal explanation as to the interpretation of your code of conduct. And uh, the, pre the prior speaker talked about the modes with which the Su U.S. Supreme Court has limited free speech. But one of the things that they uh, struck down as unconstitutional is prior restraint. And uh, the city attorney can chime in on this, but prior restraint is sort of what happened tonight and is when some sort of an administrative system like yours or even a court order stops speech from occurring. And these kinds of uh, restrictions say, you know, um, take several forms, including injunctions on speech and uh, licensing permit systems. And it was abhorred by our founding fathers because of the colonial British used this quite a bit. So you understand how steeped this right is in our system. 
in the U.S. constitutional system as interpreted appropriately by surprisingly nine-member um, board of the U.S. Supreme Court. So the bottom line of all of this is what happened tonight, unless you have a different interpretation of the First Amendment, does not constitute a personal attack. And uh, especially under the standard review of the U.S. Supreme Court that distinguishes private citizens as opposed to public figures. And public figures, when you're talking about public figures, the public has a paramount, a tantamount right to know about their publicly elected official. And this is a constitutionally protected right that outweighs public officials' right to privacy. So unless you want to super protect the membership of the council, and you're coming out and saying that through prior restraint, what happened tonight is unconstitutional and it's a violation of free speech. So I would ask you to, A, do your own research on the matter, and then we need to, as a citizens of this community, a specific answer by the city attorney as how your code of conduct is being interpreted. Um, I find it very, very troubling when you can tell members of the public that they cannot speak unless it is complimentary. And I don't know if that was misused, but that's the very definition of prior restraint, which is viewed as unconstitutional in this country. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Caleb, Hein, do you have your hand up? Yes, I do. Go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll make it quick as we're getting late. Thanks for staying so late. Um, I guess uh, I'm a little, uh, city council, I'm a little bit confused about uh, proceedings, uh, you know, that, that I've been a part of. On June 2nd of 2020, the council passed the Civilian Oversight Board uh, for the police due to pressure of a dis disrespectful group. Um, tonight, I would point out that the good majority of this council voted to have an expert or professional on the board of, uh, of a committee. And so um, I guess I'd like, as, as uh, Janine Jordan, the city manager, goes about to, you know, uh, identifying and looks for options to the city council for the creation of a civilian oversight board, I guess what I'd like to see is uh, the same sentiment um, for professionals being on a board like that as uh, as it would be on a committee board. Anyways, um, that was my comment, and uh, yeah, I'll let you all get get uh, get to bed. <laughs> thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Caleb. Christopher Stratton, you have your hand up. Yes, I sure do. Thank you very much for allowing me to do comment at the end of the night. Thank you guys for all that you are doing and staying the hours that you are. Um, my current comment is pretty much the same one that I have at every city council meeting. However, it's become more and more prevalent within Laramie, where we are number one whenever it comes to COVID for the state of Wyoming. Um, I just have major problems right now. I even sent you guys, uh, asked the city on this. Um, Bars and restaurants in Lonnie, Wyoming during night hours are definitely going against the even more flexible rules of uh, patronage, especially Roxy's, whenever they have people that are, you know, definitely not six feet apart, definitely not wearing masks, etc. I, I do kind of wonder what sort of... Uh, Ex, you know, does does she have any forms of uh, being able to do that? Christopher, I'd ask you to make general comments rather than okay. comments directed to... Okay, on a general to, comment? General comments about... This, okay, general yeah. comment to the city of Laramie. You guys are doing a very, very, very poor job in maintaining the orders that were set by the state. I wish and hope that you can actually enforce those please do so because unfortunately we are definitely the top of the covid pandemic for the state of wyoming and there is nothing being done about this 
Thank you. Have a great night, and I will generalize that. Okay, and thank you, Christopher. Also, you could send specifics to staff that we'll follow up on. I did, and I have not received a response. No, but not in the city council venue. Is there anyone else that would like to make comments to the city council before we adjourn? Nancy Sendelar, go ahead. This will be our last comment. Uh, yeah, just wanted to thank you for working on the ordinance and stopping before we all fall asleep because our brains are tired. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, not Honorable Council. Okay, thank you, Nancy. Councillor Pierce, you're up. Excuse me, Pierce. Councillor Pierce. Councillor Pierce, yes. you want to do item number 15, I think it is? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Just a second. Um, I just want you to know I'm slightly... Uh, Ryan, go ahead. Um, if we're going to uh, not do the executive sessions We tonight, need to vote not to. Can we postpone those to the yep. next regular meeting? Yeah. Okay, I think I got a note. I got an email from Nancy, so I've got it. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. So, Ryan, you're saying we have to officially say we'll not do executive council. Yeah, correct. could someone make that motion and then we'll vote on it? I think she was. No, 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 to... I can do it all in one swoop. I, I got it, Mayor. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. I move that we adjourn and postpone the executive session to the next regular meeting. Second. I moved and seconded. Okay, non-debatable. All in favor? Let's see, do we do roll call on this since it's a non-debatable item? Let's do roll call on adjournment and uh, okay. adjournment and ending the, the meeting. And postponement. Postponement. Okay. Uh, McKinney? Yes. Stalder? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Uh, Schuster? Yes. Weaver? No. <laughs> Majority? Yes. Pierce? Yes. Gabriel? Yes. And Shumway? Yes. Okay. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Would you please stay and help sanitize your area before you go? No. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. You have some sanitary boys. Good night. Uh, come on. Uh, run out. Oh. That's what this thing is down here. <laughs>